What's up, peers? And I welcome you to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. My name is Max Hillebrand, and today I conjure up some deep magic with the one and only Bitcoin sorcerer, Ruben Thompson. Today we talk about the pure magic that is Bitcoin sidechains, and about many different ways of actually setting up these sidechains and enforcing them, verifying them, but ultimately using them. Right? This is a very interesting technology to further improve the usability of Bitcoin uh, in the sense that it's basically a money warehouse. And so you can give your Bitcoin to a certain federated uh, entity uh, and that uh, this federation takes care of your on-chain Bitcoin in exchange for issuing a debt certificate, an IOU, a, a money uh, certificate that gives you a claim on the actual base money, which is the Bitcoin on the parent layer blockchain, right? but you can use this uh, debt certificate at par for actually trading real Bitcoin. Now, the, there are many, many, many interesting economic principles to consider here, as well as, uh, of course, technological and trust-related issues where every user of these sidechains uh, needs to make an educated uh, decision of how to protect as well uh, and with what counterparties uh, to work with. Uh, so uh, this is going to be a very interesting deep dive uh, into federated sidechains uh, with one-way packs, two-way packs, space chains, soft chains, and all other things that we can do with this. Very long and very dense episode, but for sure worth it. And as we actually mentioned at the end of this episode too, uh, you, of course, have the ability now with the podcasting 2.0 to use the Lightning Network, not necessarily a sidechain, but still it's cool uh, to actually toss us some stats here during the conversation if you like it. So head over to a podcasting 2.0 compatible podcatcher, like for example Breeze Wallet, to enjoy the latest and greatest of free speech and free money combined. Um, but without any further ado, here is my conversation with Ruben Thompson from the Unhashed Podcast, uh, one of the great Bitcoin sorcerers out there. So, Piers, enjoy it. So, Ruben, thank you very much for joining me today here. Yeah, no problem. I, I'm I'm curious, what was your kind of motivation to start digging down into the Bitcoin rabbit hole specifically? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, there are many ways in which I guess I can address this question, but um, it definitely, you know, it started for me in a, at a very basic level, uh, with me sort of, you know, having the time to look into new things and uh, learning about Bitcoin and sort of just getting fascinated by it. And once I got, uh, you know, interested and I learned about it and I thought, oh, this is really cool and it's, it's going to be really big. It's going to be bigger than it is. Um, at that point, I was just sort of thinking, you know, how is this going to evolve? Um, and so, so for Bitcoin specifically, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, it, it's this huge thing that I think we all agree will, well, already has a massive impact on the world. And, and it's only going to get bigger, right? The more, uh, it, the more, uh, popular it, it gets and the more, uh, we, more work we do basically on it. So I guess at the time I was just looking how, how to, like, how to position myself. Within that, that framework of having this, this thing, this, this organism almost, right? The, the, the Bitcoin entity. Uh, how, how do I, you know, how do I interact with it? And I think there, there are, there are different ways of, of doing that, right? Like, for instance, you can just buy some Bitcoins and you can just sit on your ass and you can do nothing, right? Well, that'd be one way of doing it, but that would be sort of like, I, I mean, it's maybe a stretch to call it parasitic, but, you're not contributing anything. And I think this, this comes from, from two, you know, there are two separate ways of looking at this, right? Like, I think some people just look at Bitcoin and they think this thing just works for no reason. Uh, but that's not true. It, it works because there are people behind it that care about it a lot. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the developers, uh, also people that 
make decisions when there is a fork, like uh, Segway2x, right? Which direction do you want to take things? Which direction should things be taken? Uh, and that's all kind of like active. So looking at it from that perspective, I just, I guess like, I just felt this um, um, oblig- well, obligation, not the right word, but like, um, it, I, I wanted to kind of be part of it in a positive way, right? And not just in a parasitic way. And that started off with me uh, organizing meetups here in uh, in in Seoul. I'm not I'm not in Seoul at the moment. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's um, it, it's it's also partially because I I think well even even today I think but but especially back then this was 2014 it was still really small and I felt like it could have a big impact and I think that connected with my desire to. I don't know, do something that has meaning, you know, in the world, like something that resonates, I don't know, that, that touches the lives of a lot of people. And, you know, I don't, I don't care whether that's like in some kind of bombastic way that is like super obvious to everyone or whether that's, you know, something like Bitcoin that has, is going to have a huge impact. And then if I have a minor impact on the huge impact that Bitcoin has, uh, that is very fulfilling to me. I feel like that's, you know, I, I feel like I do something worthwhile with my time. So a lot of the, uh, you know, the layer two projects that I've been working out are probably going to be getting into eventually on this podcast. I think it's kind of been motivated by that feeling that I have something to contribute that is going to be useful in the world. Uh, you know, it might take a long time before we get to that point. Uh, a lot of my layer two ideas are kind of like a little bit more like farther into the future useful as opposed to right now useful. Um, but I, I do think we'll get there eventually. So that's been very motivating. And, um, yeah, I just, I didn't want to be, you know, just a parasite freeloader, but I wanted to kind of be part of it. And I think that's also necessary. That's what Bitcoin needs. And that was also my thought when I started the meetup to sort of try and help other people get to the point where I am. And I, I still think that's very important today. Like a lot of people, they get into Bitcoin now and they, you know, they come in through the, I don't know, the, the number go up meme, right? They see the, the meme and, uh, they, um, they don't really go farther than that, right? Uh, and, and I, I wonder actually, I'm also curious about your opinion about this, but I've been thinking like these, uh, we have a lot of number go up warriors, as I call them. And, uh, I don't know if that's, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that that's parasitic. Um, but I, I guess, I guess my position on that is that we, the number just goes up. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to proclaim the number go up meme in order for people to see that the number goes up. So I sort of feel that people who think that they are doing enough for Bitcoin or they're, they're, they're helping Bitcoin by helping, I don't know, the number go up meme or something like that. I, I think, I think you're not doing a lot if you're doing that. Um, and I, I don't think everybody has to do a lot, but. Uh, I don't think you should, uh, uh, no. I, I think people overestimate, <laughs> you know, how important they are when they're, uh, when they're pro- proclaiming the number go up meme, uh, to others. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to hear other opinions, kind of like how, do, how do you, how you see that, for instance? Yeah, I would say that focusing the value of Bitcoin on the single exchange pair between a fiat shitcoin like the US dollar is very narrow in scope. Um, mm. because, well, that this number is, is both supply and demand for Bitcoin and US dollars. And of course, both of these are media of exchange, right? So th- this is not the purchase of a production good or a consumption good for money, right? But this is trading to monetary like instruments. Uh, and that is very different than the vast majority of economic trade, right? Where you mm. buy a good or service for money, right? So. Mm. For for me, that market of what can I actually buy with my Bitcoin is more interesting to what can I speculate with in in a different medium of exchange. Uh, because again, when when a production good or consumption good is exchanged for money, this is uh, not a zero sum game. Both participants uh, benefit. Yeah. While when trading to media of exchange, in the future, one of these media exchange will purchase more than the other. Uh, and therefore it is a zero sum game and there is yeah. one winner and one loser, uh, making it a very, very different type of, of interaction. Mm. 
So it's interesting uh, because you bring up the um, people using it actually to purchase goods and services. And I sort of feel that that's like still too early. Like I feel Bitcoin is not quite at a level where uh, that is something that people, I mean, they can do it now, but it just, it, it doesn't seem like Bitcoin is ready for that. I feel like Bitcoin first needs to become much bigger. And then when we get to a point where there are lots of layer twos that are easy to use, uh, and the, the price maybe has stabilized compared to right now, it's still being quite volatile. I think at that point, uh, we'll, we'll see it being used more, uh, for purchases and, and goods and services and things like that. Uh, but I do agree, uh, with the kind of the general, like you make a good point, right? About the, uh, trading one fiat currency for another, uh, for another, um, uh, well, not fiat, but like, yeah, both both are just currencies, right? That people use to store value. Um, there is probably not a whole lot of value there, right? For doing doing those trades. Um, so yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, but nevertheless, right? Holding money and saving money is already a very um, important part of the economic capital allocation structure. So it's yeah. it's definitely something important. But you're right; it's it's not everything, right? You yeah. you save your money so that you will invest it in the future. To build something useful, right? And, uh, your time preference is always positive in the sense that you act every day, all the time, right? And you yeah. do spend your, your, your time and your energy and your Bitcoin on all types of activities. Uh, so th- th- this is kind of where the actual exchange happens, right? And mm-hmm. the, the point of saving up to this exchange is, is nevertheless important. Yeah. And I guess, uh, you know, one thing that I sort of worry about, uh, into the future is that, um, people like I already like just now, like somebody contacted me th- through the Soul Bitcoin meetup and, um, you know, he was just asking about some, some kind of uh, altcoin, uh, whether or not it was a good investment. And, you know, like I get questions like that all the time. And I was just, you know, give very like negative answers where I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, touching any of these, uh, these shit coins basically. Uh, but you know, that, that's not my point. Like my point is the guy, like I told him, like Bitcoin is already a risky investment and you're going out and you're finding, you're trying to find these small coins and then you're trying to get it, find an even riskier investments because you like the upside more. Right. And like, how insane is that? And then, and then he's, he, he told me, he said like, huh, interesting that you think Bitcoin is a risky investment. And that that's sort of like, I think that's dangerous thinking. Like if people, Especially people that don't really understand Bitcoin that well. Uh, and I understand like, you know, Bitcoin has been doing well. Uh, recently we haven't had like a, a big bear, uh, uh, cycle. Uh, it's been a, been a while now and things are going relatively slow and steady up. Um, but if, if people get the idea that this is not risky, I think they're going to be in for a world of hurts because there's going to be like a huge bear cycle. And these people that, that think this is a safe investment, they're going to get scared as hell. Um, and like, like ultimately I feel like in order for these people to really be in Bitcoin and be ready for <laughs> the, the ups and the downs, you need to really understand what you're putting your money into. It's very easy to put your money in something that goes up, right? I, I put my money in, number goes up, I have more money. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. I'll, I'll hold some Bitcoins. That, that's the easy part, right? But th- when the shit hits the fan, these people need to also, uh, be able to continue to participate. Um, and that is like, that's where I think like the kind of the number go up meme, you know, is insufficient. Uh, these people are not going to be prepared for, uh, what is eventually inevitably going to happen. Yes. And I love that I see with so many Bitcoiners this passion and this huge motivation of the work that they do in this space. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's great to see that with you too, right? Both for educating others about this technology, but then doing cutting edge research. And yep. actually creating new ideas about this. I mean, that, yeah. that, that must be very rewarding, motivating work. Yeah. And I, I sort of pivoted into that, right? So I, I started off kind of educating and, you know, I, I guess the thing about teachers is teachers actually learn a lot while teaching. Um, and <laughs> eventually I got to a point where, uh, I was kind of able to contribute back and, uh, create uh, layer two ideas that are, a, a, at least in my view, extremely valuable. And are going to see a lot of use uh, in the future when, especially once uh, Bitcoin's, uh, uh, you know, the fees uh, kind of gets high in a stable manner. I mean, they're high now, but they're they're not like 
I don't know, I expect them to go down again to one Satoshi per byte eventually. Uh, but once we get to that point where they're really expensive and people, you know, people are forced to take layer two solutions more seriously, I think then uh, people will have to kind of look into the things that I've been looking into. Yes, and uh, I'm really curious about how your perception of this Bitcoin organism, as you said it before, specifically the base layer blockchain, how did your understanding of what this actually is useful for change over the years? Um, well, I, I certainly started off just having less informed opinions, I guess, than I do now. Um, but yeah, I always from the start kind of took a, a really like critical approach and just looked at it and said, how can this break? Right. How can this stop working? Um, and I think that's a great question. Uh, to understand what the capabilities are by looking at the weaknesses and by knowing where it stops working, you gain confidence in all the places where it does work. Um, and yeah, so I think from that perspective, um, I sort of, um, I guess I see it now, uh, as I guess to me it's obvious, but maybe it's probably not obvious to everyone. Uh, I, I see it as this this thing where we have one block every 10 minutes and there is a limited amount of space with every block. And this is just inherent to the system. Like we can't really, I mean, there there's some ways to get around it and some of these ways I've, I've come up with. But generally speaking, that is really the, the limit. So in order to get more out of Bitcoin, you have to somehow take those inherent limitations and you have to do something to work with them despite this limit and despite this limitation, do more than you were doing today. Um, and that's really kind of what a lot of my research has been kind of, uh, you know, focused on to not just say like, Oh, uh, we're just going to decrease the security, right? We're going to make Bitcoin less secure. Uh, and then we get scaling because the decrease in security will lead to an increase in uh, other things we can do. Like, for instance, if you increase the block size, uh, it'll be harder for people to run full nodes, uh, which is a decrease in security in, in a sense, uh, but we'll have more more transactions. Like, that's that's the kind of trade-off that's frankly quite terrible. And, you know, the ironic thing is uh, you see a lot of the alt these altcoins uh, making these trade-offs. And, you know, it's always this this kind of claim that, oh, it's still safe when it's uh, 32 megabytes or something. Right, it, it's it's when you get to sixty four megabytes, that's when it's not safe. You know, like it's something like that, right? Where there always have this this kind of excuse, where it's saying like, oh no, no, this is still okay, but that that's no longer okay. Whereas for me, I look at Bitcoin, and I'm I'm kind of more like you know, there's something Luke Junior says as well. It's like, what, well, maybe we should have a block size decrease, right? Well, maybe we should have less transactions. Is it is it secure enough now? I don't know. Um, so it it's you know, it's more of that like mentality of um looking at it and not just assuming oh oh these this is okay but always like having the back of your head like well maybe it isn't right maybe it won't go well and i think one of the it, it kind of easy solutions was to make digital payments and digital transactions i mean arguably we figured that out almost perfectly and scalably with chomi and ecash back what in the 1980s somewhere right mm. I think the beauty of Bitcoin is not about making these transactions, it's about verifying them. Right? And all of a sudden, this is a very different type of framework of how much can we actually expect other market participants to uh, expend computing power and bandwidth and storage and so on uh, to verify the money that they have received. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think there are, there are two two parts of about this because... Yes, uh, Chomi and eCash was not verifiable. Uh, like the server could mint more coins without you knowing that the server was minting more coins. Uh, but there's also the aspect of uh, censorship resistance, right? Where the Chomi and eCash server can... Okay, they don't know who you are, so it's maybe unlikely that they do this, but they could start censoring everybody and just say, like, look, if you want me to sent this uh if you want to send over this token to somebody you have to identify yourself so there was a censorship resistance problem and there's a verifiability problem i guess 
Um, so it's a bit of both because like technically, I, I don't think it would have been a stretch to say that somebody could have done something like Bitcoin, but just on a central server, uh, years ago. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit of a stretch in the sense that probably it would have been too much bandwidth back then or just very low transactions per second. Uh, so maybe from that perspective, it wouldn't be very uh, doable. Um, but yeah, I think, I think those, those are the two core aspects, the censorship resistance. Um, and what you mentioned, where you could actually verify everything that happened. So for what type of use cases do you actually see a big demand for on apparent like base layer blockchain activity? Well, the way I see it is that if you have a transaction that requires such censorship resistance and requires a high proof of work, then you want to use the ba base layer. Uh, but in any time that that's not the case, I, I sort of think ideally you should have alternative options. So, for example, let's say I want to buy, I want to purchase my coffee from the coffee house next door. That's not a censorship resistant transaction. I am not worried that my government or anyone is going to stop me from purchasing a coffee. Um, even if somebody wants to see that I purchased a coffee and it's not private, I, I wouldn't be very, uh, you know, I wouldn't have much of a problem with that. Uh, although, generally speaking, I, w I would prefer privacy. Um, so I think we really need to look at this and say, like, okay, it's limited. Not everybody's just going to be able to use the base layer. Uh, so we have to have this variety of options. And, you know, low, low fee transactions or low, uh, amounts, uh, transactions with low amounts, probably both won't be able to get on the base layer and should be should it should suffice for those to be elsewhere if they are just not very important transactions now i guess depending on which which country you are in uh, maybe uh, you know your your low value payments uh, from my perspective is a high value payment to you uh, and, and those kinds of things would be unfortunate but you know, we can only i guess we can only scale it you know, as like, like, there's no, as much as I wish everybody could just put their transaction on the base layer, uh, that's just simply not the case. So we have to really find ways for people who don't like need that ultimate security, uh, to go elsewhere and do those less important transactions on perhaps less secure, uh, alternatives, but it's acceptable because we're talking about, uh, smaller amounts of, of money. Yes, I think that uh, trust and uh, the willingness to lay off responsibility to some other protocol or even individuals uh, is in many situations a, a favorable trade-off uh, and subjective, of course, to the individual. And so it's uh, impossible to make an arbitrary judgment uh, that holding your money in a single custodian is, is a bad thing uh, because maybe for uh, that one user it is a well-justified risk trade-off. Yeah, I, I think I would I'd ideally see it as, uh, well, I guess it depends on how much you're, you're saving. Like if you're living paycheck to paycheck, maybe it, it's, it's okay to just be on a chain like that. But, um, if you have any kinds of savings, and I do think, you know, that's something that's, uh, maybe also kind of important to point out where you know, today we have a lot of, uh, people that try, are trying to store value in places that are not necessarily ideal for storing value, like uh, housing, for instance. People, you know, buy into the housing markets really to just, really as a way of just storing value and as getting away from from fiat uh, inflation. So, if Bitcoin gets bigger, I think a lot of that money kind of goes away and, and goes into Bitcoin, right? Goes out of out of the housing market, out of I don't know. Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not a uh, expert on, uh, um, uh, investment and things like that. So I don't know what else is out there, but I'm sure there, there are lots of people that are trying to store their value in places that is, they're just trying to escape inflation and Bitcoin is the alternative. So yeah, I think of it as, okay, if you have a lot of value, you just park it on the Bitcoin blockchain. And if you have your day to day expenses, you move part of it over to a sidechain, federated sidechain, for instance. Or hopefully we can have better systems than that that are, are, are more decentralized, but you know, that's always tricky. They're trade-offs. Um, and they use that smaller amount there. And then, you know, 
maybe once a year they interact with the the base layer or something like that, or, or maybe even less depending on uh, the necessity. Um, but that's kind of how I would see it, where you try to minimize, but still use it, but just sparingly. Yes, so maybe to summarize this, that the, the Bitcoin base layer is so unique because it provides two great aspects, and that is for one, that it is permissionless and censorship resistant to write a new transaction uh, and, and to bring that to the blockchain, uh, while simultaneously that every individual node in the network has the power to verify every transaction and therefore the sum of the money supply. And so this is a quite an inefficient and very costly process uh, which gives, of course, great security right? and, and autonomy and sovereignty. Yeah. Though for, for many transactions, this is not really a justifiable expense, a kind of wasted resources driving a tank to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say there are two kind of um, like different approaches to solve this type of problem. Um, the first being the Lightning Network and the second being sidechains. Uh, just... Could you briefly touch on the Lightning Network and how its yeah. architecture is different to uh, sidechains? Yeah. So, so far, at least the sidechains we've been talking about are our so-called federated sidechains. Um, so, specific to a federated sidechain, you are basically trusting a group of people. So, there is a, if you want to move your money to a sidechain, you basically send your Bitcoins to a multisig address. And then the people that control that multisig address then credit you on a federated sidechain. And then you can move your coins on this other chain. And when you want to move back out, you trust that these people will give you your coins. Um, so there's trust involved. But the nice thing compared to traditional systems is that it's distributed trust. You can have a big multisig federation all over the world with lots of different countries participating. And then as long as some majority of those uh, countries uh, cooperates with you, you're going to be okay. Um, so that's that's one way of doing it. Um, and I think that's sort of the kind of the you know middle solution where it's a solution that's enabled by the existence of Bitcoin because we didn't have this kind of multi-sig where multiple people could control uh, value uh, at, at, together. Um, but it is obviously still a point of trust. Um, so it's not ideal in, in that regard. And I think the Lightning Network is sort of a more uh, ideal version of trying to take Bitcoin payments and taking them off of the, the main chain so you don't have to make uh, on-chain transactions all the time. But what you do instead is you create a channel together with somebody and you have these sort of... Um, uh, degree, uh, you have, you have basically, uh, you can hop from one channel to another channel. So an example would be Alice and Bob have a channel and then Bob and Carol have a channel. And what you then can do is by doing some smart, uh, scripting, uh, that is compatible with the Bitcoin blockchain, you can make it so that Alice will give a Bitcoin to Bob, provided Bob gives a Bitcoin to Carol. And by making that so-called atomic payment, uh, you can now basically move coins from one channel to another channel and these channels they can exist entirely off chain and only if something goes wrong and if there's a disagreement uh, are you then forced onto the bitcoin blockchain but the assumption is that everybody will just cooperate because they know that if they don't cooperate there's still there's not any money in it for them uh you just go to the bitcoin blockchain and uh, everybody gets the money that they're owed so the assumption is everybody cooperates and therefore it remains off chain yeah, I think that's a nice uh, differentiation. And maybe a, one analogy is useful here, and that's that a Bitcoin address or UTXO is basically this unbreakable vault, you know, this secure treasury chest where you can keep gold coins uh, stored, right? the gold coins being Satoshis. Um, and this can be a naive single signature uh, address right, where you only need to prove one signature of one public key so to spend these coins again. And so this is your regular everyday Wasabi wallet, Electrum wallet, or whatnot. Um, and, but, but this is rather naive, because for every transaction that you make, you need to tell the entire Bitcoin network that you're spending this coin and creating this new one. So everyone needs to verify every transaction. And while the Lightning Network is more in the sense that you collaborate with another party to share the ownership over this Bitcoin vault, in a two out of two multi-signature, 
right? So now you need to provide two signatures in order to actually spend the money again. But you only put money into this contract or into this vault if you have the cryptographic assurance that in any case you could get this money out of there again. Right? We do that with these Lightning Network pre-signed transactions. So that even if the other party goes offline or even publishes a, a old channel state, you can always still get your money back. So in the Lightning Network, even though you do not tell everyone about the transactions that you make, because you make them off-chain in your payment channel, um, you always have the guarantee to go back on-chain and actually claim the Bitcoin back for yourself to however you want to use that. While, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, no, uh, side chains are somewhat of a different approach. It's because here you relinquish the control over the Bitcoin completely. And so you spend out of your single signature wallet or even out of your Lightning Network channel. You spend your Bitcoin into an address that is not controlled by you, by but by rather, for example, 11 out of 15 uh, co-signers, so to say. Uh, but for the Bitcoin blockchain itself, you have relinquished that control and the Bitcoin is no longer yours officially. And so there is this trust that this federation of, say, 11 out of 15 can spend on chain the Bitcoin however they want. Uh, yeah. In this sense, basically a, a bank account, right? A money warehouse. Uh, this group of people or companies uh, take care to not or, or take care of your Bitcoin and could theoretically spend them, but they promise that they won't. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, uh, summary. And, uh, and yeah, it's good, good, like a uh, good explanation of like how the uh, trust is different between the two. Um, one thing I think is important to add because like kind of like if you compare the two, it just sort of sounds like, uh, federated sidechains suck and lightning is amazing. <laughs> and in a way, that's true, right? Because a uh, lightning network does have, uh, you know, better, uh, decentralization basically where, where you, you don't, you don't have to really trust anyone. Uh, you just have to be able to go onto the Bitcoin blockchain and settle if absolutely it's necessary. Um, but what's important to point out is that the Lightning Network is one, quite complex because you have to interact with lots of different people. Uh, if you want to hop, uh, between lots of different channels. So Alice to Bob, Bob to Carol, Carol to Dave, Dave to Eve, et cetera. Uh, it's a lot of complexity, a lot of communication. So that's kind of tricky, but you know, software can kind of solve that. But then the second issue is sort of a throughput issue. Uh, with a federated sidechain, there really is no limit to how many coins you can send. You can send uh, a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to a federated sidechain, and then you can send that billion dollars in any way you want to anyone who is also using the federated sidechain. Uh, but on the Lightning Network, you are constricted by how many coins are in each channel. So if you go through a lot of hops, uh, all these hops have a certain amount of coins in them, and you can only you know send as much as there is liquidity available. Um, so it becomes sort of, uh, it, it's excellent for smaller payments, um, at least to, to a certain degree. Uh, but for larger payments, uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, insufficient or, or difficult, uh, to use. So that's sort of the trade off. Um, and I think just very generally speaking, we need everything, right? So one is not better than the other. It's not like, oh, everybody will use lightning. Nobody will use federated sites. I don't think it's anything like that at all. I think we're going to have lots of different trade-offs with lots of different layer two systems and people are going to use all of them depending on their needs. Yes, I do tend to agree with this. Uh, again, fiduciary media are, are quite interesting. They have been prevalent in, in the gold sc standard as well and that you get paper certificates based on the gold that you have in the vault. Uh, and that's somewhat similar with a sidechain, right? You, you put your money into the care of these 11 out of 15 custodians uh, but in return, you get this token on the sidechain uh, where only you can spend it. And so on the sidechain, only you know the private key of this specific UTXO, and therefore only you can spend it. And so the, the, the ownership of the token, like the paper certificate of gold, has a lot of censorship resistance aspects. Um, where and even privacy aspects, right? That the the bank vault does not know or cannot stop its users from sending the paper certificates to another place or to another person. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. But yeah, I do think uh, federated sidechains generally, um, yeah, with the paper certificates, yeah, it's kind of a weird, I guess, analogy. But uh, they can always stop the trading, right? Like if they control the federated sidechain, 
Uh, well, I guess it depends on on how you do it, right? You could you could issue a token on a decentralized blockchain, then the trading can't really be stopped. But it's always the uh, the issuer at the end of the day, because like you're saying, right? It's an IOU. Even when you use a federated sidechain, you always have to go back to uh, the federation and say, "Hey, can I withdraw my coins now?" And there is a chance that they say no, and, and that is really inherently the risk. And it's important for everybody to understand that risk. But I think it's still a very acceptable trade-off, depending on the circumstance. Yes, I, I think so too. Uh, can you maybe go a bit more into the details of how we can actually pack in and pack out Bitcoin from the parent chain into these side chains? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's very easy to peg in. Pegging in is just literally giving, sending coins to a multi-sig address. So like you, you said in your example, it will be an 11, 11 out of 15. And then once you've sent your coins, uh, they will credit you on this, this other chain. Um, and the pegging out part is that on this other chain, you just basically say like, Hey, I'm ready to peg out now. Uh, you do this just by making a transaction. Uh, and, and these coins are going to be destroyed, uh, basically on this chain. And then once that is, once that happened, you will uh, hope <laughs> that the federation then goes uh, and takes some of their coins on the Bitcoin blockchain and sends them to you and sends them the uh, sends you the equivalent of whatever you try to peg out. Uh, and that's essentially how it works. Okay, but how or w- w- in what sense is here already a trust into the federation? Because what would happen if I send in the peg in process, I send Bitcoin to this 11 out of 15 multi signature? Are there any cryptographic assurances that I will indeed get a token on the sidechain in exchange for them? Mm. Well, I think I think at that point it it actually kind of stops mattering because at that point they just have your your coins. So even if they give you a token on the sidechain, it's an IOU, uh, and this IOU they don't have to value it, right? Like the uh, the federation can give you the token on the sidechain and then declare to everybody, uh, okay, this this token. Uh, I, I'm not going to recognize or something, right? Like they could say something like that and that will be just as damning as them not giving you the token in the first place. And we've seen this with things like USD Tether where they can actually, uh, they can censor certain coins and just say like, yo, no, these, these are not allowed anymore. Anybody who accepts these are, is just not going to get any, any, uh, uh, USD. So, uh, but yeah, to your point, um, there are two ways of doing it. Um, so you could have a chain. That literally watches the Bitcoin blockchain and when it sees the transaction, it automatically credits people on the sidechain. Uh, so you could do something like that to, um, sort of prevent censorship. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is one of my uh, proposals. Space chains, uh, can do this. Um, so you could have sort of like a completely, so you could have a completely decentralized chain. And this decentralized chain is also fully aware of what happens on the Bitcoin blockchain. And when you do that, you can automate the pegins. Uh, so then the pegins become censorship resistant. Uh, but I still don't think it adds much because you have a censorship resistant creation of an IOU and the IOU is not a censorship resistant at all. Um, but yeah, it's technically possible. Uh huh. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess it. Yeah, it might reduce at least some level of trust, but as you say, ultimately, uh, the person who controls the on-chain Bitcoin, well, wins in, in, in any case. Right? Yeah. And I, I think it's sort of a regulatory arbitrage play in general, of these federations, right? Where what we're really betting on is that it's going to be very difficult to regulate these things. Uh, and because of that, it works. Um, and the harder you make that, the better. And I think the more decentralization there is, so in this case, uh, you are, you know, you, you're making sure the chain itself uh, is not also controlled by uh, the federation. I think that's a point in favor of uh, successful regulatory arbitrage, where it's harder for uh, regulators to do something about it. But ultimately, it doesn't prevent, uh, you know, someone for, from actually taking action. Yeah, so is there a difference between those who actually hold private keys to the on-chain Bitcoin? parent chain bitcoin and those who create blocks of the side chain that's a design de- design decision uh, so you could do both uh you know just to give you kind of an example that i think is easier for people to grasp um you can issue tokens on the ethereum blockchain 
and and these can be federated sidechain tokens, right? These can be tokens that are, are Bitcoin. I think a WBTC is one of them. I don't know if they're held by a federation or a single entity, but you know, just for uh, argument's sake, let's say it's a federation. Um, so now you have separated the two, right? You have separated the uh, uh, movement of the tokens from uh, the custody. Uh, so that's entirely possible. And then you can even go as far as to say like, okay, well, you can send maybe like small SPV like proofs to the uh, Ethereum blockchain for the pegins. So then, you know, the pegins are also automated. Uh, so you could do it like that uh, on Ethereum, for instance. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, I-, I would want to use Ethereum for that use case, but uh, it's possible. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. Yeah, but again, with here, right, more federation, more distribution of control and access rights will, will make it more complicated, <laughs> therefore more easy to screw up, but also <laughs> be more resilient uh, in terms of attack and censorship. Yeah. And again, like, you know, like, there, there is just a point of trust, right? The federation is the point of trust. We're not getting around that. Um, but at least it's harder for regulators to pinpoint where the, um, they're going to be more confused, basically, when the, the chain moves on its own and the tokens, s- similar to your paper example, right? Uh, if the federation doesn't control the chain, it doesn't control whether or not you give the piece of paper to somebody else. Yeah, but what what I'm wondering here is then, if we already kind of trust this federation, why is there even a need for a a blockchain for the sidechain in the first place? Why (laughs) couldn't we just have a somewhat a a distributed eCash server? Um, I think part of it is at least the uh, that you want some guarantee that the federation isn't inflating on you. Um. If there is, uh, it, it, let's say if you do a, a, an eCash uh, server that is, or eCash federation, right? Then maybe at some point, uh, somebody says like, oh my God, there is inflation. And nobody knows if that's a true claim or a false claim. And the federation can't do anything to dispute that claim. So everybody panics and everybody pegs out. And then it turns out there was no inflation. And it's like, okay. <laughs> you know, so, um, absolutely necessary. If you trust the Federation, no. But I think for the continual trust that the Federation is currently behaving correctly, uh, it is very beneficial for it to be completely transparent and, and you're able to, to validate that no, uh, inflation is occurring. Yes, I think that's a very valid point, right? That, uh, w- with this blockchain structure, at least we can verify the integrity of the money certificates uh, that were issued on the sidechain and how, ma- how many sidechain tokens are there. Uh, and potentially that can even be referred to the, uh, like a proof of the on-chain pack-in transactions. Um, is that always the case that you can verify, uh, the, the amount of Bitcoin held in reserve? Uh, well, so the thing with, uh, some, like Liquid specifically, they're actually making the peg in hidden and you have to reveal the peg in to the federation in order to claim your coins, which I think is uh, like, I get the reasoning. The reasoning behind it is that they wanted to be censorship resistant from, uh, Bitcoin miners. Because if you, if the peg in is recognizable by everyone, then Bitcoin miners might censor the peg in. Uh, and so in order to prevent that, uh, they, they did it like this. But I do think it sort of gets in the way, like, like maybe it's still okay because the, you can reveal, um, the peg in. But I, I think ideally it would be nicer if you could just see everybody who pegged in, everybody who could pegged out, uh, could, uh, who pegged out, uh, and not try to hide it. Uh, and then you would have, uh, more of a guarantee, uh, that, uh, there, yeah, there is no, uh, no inflation occurring or, or nobody's, you know, no coins are missing basically. And that's, yeah, I, I think that's a really, you know, that's highly, highly valuable. If you're, if you have like, like it's sort of like a cor- corporation, right? The federation, you could see it as a corporation that is just doing everything complete transparency and you're auditing it 24 seven by running a full node. I mean, that's, that is inherently, I think, very valuable. Yes, I, I tend to agree uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, w- but one of the things you bring up here is very interesting, and that is that the Federation itself actually has a interest in being private here and in not revealing that their parent chain blockchain footprint 
um, makes it obvious that these are uh, transactions of that federation either to pack in or to pack out it, it just because of censorship. Um, now, why is it that censorship, even temporal censorship, is a problem for a federation? Well, yeah, so I'm not sure if it is a problem, to be honest. Um, on the pegging in parts, I, I have a hard time imagining why a, uh, why a Bitcoin miners would ever want to censor a peg in. Um, maybe in some weird competitive environment where there are lots of sidechains and the miners run sidechains and they don't want anyone else to run sidechains or something, uh, they start to censor these transactions. So I haven't really thought through the game theory, but. Yeah, off the top of my head, I can't really think of a good uh, scenario there, but there might be one. And if there is one, it makes sense to to make it private. And then the peg out, yeah, that's uh, that's sort of hmm. It seems like a nastier one in the sense that you're you know you're disallowing someone from getting access to their coins. But even then, you know, I sort of I sort of think of it as. Uh, you could already do that today, right? Like miners can censor anyone's coins. What again? Why would they target uh, the federation specifically? So yeah, it all all depends on whether there's a good reason for it. But yeah, I, I don't think it's viable for a federation to just completely hide their pegins and peg outs because I think then you're back to the problem of inflation and uh, not uh, uh, hidden inflation and non, um, yeah, not making it able to fully uh, validate whether or not uh, something weird is going on. Um, so yeah, it's it's a trade off there. It seems to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and one additional question is who can actually make these pickouts? Uh, are are those whitelisted individuals, nah. or can anyone do it? Well, yeah, that kind of goes like you know, like for me generally, I I think I think in very um abstract terms, right? So I talk, I say federated sidechain, and I just kind of think of oh, a whole range of possibilities. Uh, so, you know, in practice, one of the main federated sidechains that we all know is is called Liquid, and that one has a limitation on who can peg out. But that's a d design decision that they made. Uh, there's no there's no reason why every federated sidechain needs to uh, have a model like that. Um, there are security considerations there that you know I can't fully repeat off the top of my head, but it was something along the lines of. Um, Wanting to make sure that when there's a peg out, the coins go to addresses that are, um, either exchanges or known secure entities. So every peg out has to go to somebody who is actually, um, known uh, and not some an anonymous hacker or, or something. So if there is a peg out that is odd for any reason, you can point uh, the finger to uh, where who it exited the system towards? Uh, I think it's something along those lines, um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm not 100 percent certain. And this kind of per permissionless innovation and uh, changing and advancing the configuration of these side chains will be a very very interesting ecosystem, uh, as it allows for a lot of uh, kind of well, innovation, right, and, and reckless behavior in the sense of let's try out new ways to reach consensus on sidechains and to make them secure. Mm. But do you think that there is like a tendency for this to explode, that we will have thousands and thousands of sidechains running in parallel? Or do you think that there is a natural tendency towards only a selected few sidechains that receive the majority of liquidity? I think it's going to be a selected view, a few, because there are a couple of things. Like first, especially once we move to Schnorr, you'll the preference is probably going to be having federations with large numbers of participants instead of smaller fe federations. So if your choice is, you know, one out of uh, three federations that are all, I don't know, 15 out of 20 multisig, or one big federation that's 45 out of uh, 60 or whatever the number is, um, you probably want the bigger uh, federation. I think that would be kind of the the, the, the preference there. Um, and the second thing is, you know, there, there are, there are two ways to do federations. One way would be to say everybody who's in this federation is anonymous. And, um, maybe you even switch out who runs the federation every now and then. Uh, that, that's an inherently permission, by the way, like the, the existing federation needs to accept a new federation member in that case. Um, or you explicitly say, 
the Federation is known. Uh, everybody knows who the Federation members are. So if something uh, bad happens, you have legal recourse. So it's kind of weird, right? Because on one hand, you sort of like try to stave off the law. But on the other hand, you are creating points of uh, responsibility. Um, and it has up and downsides, right? Because like a completely anonymous federation, it's sort of problematic, right? Like, why would I trust a random, completely anonymous group of people f- for which you don't even know whether they're separate entities? Maybe it's all the same person, right? Maybe you're a 45 out of 60, not this big, uh, anonymous federation. It's just one, uh, one dude, uh, who is just waiting for lots of, lots more people. Uh, to put their coins in because it's, it's working right now. And then, you know, two years later, when uh, there's a, there's a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin in there, he just walks away with it. Um, so you sort of don't want that complete anonymity. Um, um, so yeah, I, I think, I think that's kind of where you end up, uh, with big federations where the, the, the federation, um, members are known. And have some kind of reputation that allows you to say, like, yeah, okay, they're probably, uh, you know, not not interested in just uh, walking away with the money after a couple of years, uh, and ideally in completely different jurisdictions. Yeah, and this I think is is going to be quite interesting to see how we can build trust and reputation between these money warehouses, right? and which conditions and which traits will be the trade of, of good entrepreneurs providing good services here and which will be the scammers. And I think a lot of trial and error uh, is to come here. Yeah. And uh, so at the very least, you know, what I think is a good step is to separate the running the chain from uh, issuing the uh, federated token, right? So, mm-hmm. and I think, uh, you know, at least uh, one of my uh, proposals uh, space chains is kind of perfect for that, uh, which, because it's, it's sort of like one of, one of the main use cases for it is, uh, basically creating a, a separate decentralized blockchain where you can issue your own assets. And those assets could be federated assets if anyone wants, right? Anybody can, like, e- you can even do this on liquid today, right? Like you and me, we could say like, okay, we're starting a, um, uh, well, not a one of two multisig that would be kind of, well, <laughs> I don't know, like a two of two multisig where people can send uh, Litecoin to us and then we give them uh, tokens on the Liquid network. And now you have Litecoin on Liquid. Uh, you know, that's just possible. Uh, people can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It's kind of a, a money warehouse inside a money warehouse. <laughs> yeah. Then in a sense, right, when when you can use the, the, the money certificate that you get from the sidechain money warehouse, uh, to actually issue other tokens as well. Uh, and that just shows the, the, the power and the, uh, um, complexity and configurability of these sidechains and right? what consensus protocol you run on the side and how you use that and what type of, uh, you know, computation you do there is very much up to you. And right? you're no longer tied to the global Bitcoin parent blockchain consensus layer. Yeah. Yeah. You can, uh, you can do anything. It's, it's completely. Uh, you know, different chain where you can choose any consensus rules you like. So it's very free in that regard. Uh, one thing I guess I should point out is that, um, specific to Liquid, the actual federation part is not open sourced. So nobody can actually take that code and start to run their own federation as of right now. I still hope that they are going to release that eventually. Um, but that's another reason why actually having, a, perhaps having a decentralized space chain uh like uh like uh, the ones i've been proposing is actually easier in that regard uh because you don't have to deal with this um the federation has to deal with the peg ins and the peg outs um so they have to sign transactions together uh, but they don't have to deal with a block creation and block signing together so that's uh at least you know that's still complicated because probably actually the uh coin management is the more complex of the two uh but it's still it's a significant uh, reduction in complexity Mm-hmm. One of the things still about having permissioned versus permissionless sidechains is, uh, so for a decentralized sidechain or blockchain in general, where anyone can add new transactions or blocks to the chain, it's it's basically impossible for that chain to ever be called officially dead, right? because as long as there is someone wants to create a new block, well, you can you can mine it and create it. Um, but with these permissioned state chains or federated uh, sidechains where uh, the block creation does kind of depend on some selected few block signers, 
Like, do you think mm-hmm. we can actually have an official end to a, a blockchain so that we are sure that there won't be any block of this in the future? Um. Well, I, I, I don't think it's necessary, I guess. Um, like, I think it's okay. As long as people want to create transactions on the chain, the chain just keeps going forward. As long as people value the token, the chain keeps going forward. Um, that seems just perfectly acceptable to me. Um, I guess, like, maybe a scenario you, you are thinking of is that, um, you have a decentralized chain and you have, you have an IOU token on that chain. So somebody issued a federated token on a decentralized chain. And then at some point, the federation wants to stop, <laughs> right? So the token is still out there, uh, but the federation says, look, guys, uh, next year, I'm just going to close, close down. So. Uh, I, I think at that point, all they can do is just say, like, look, you gotta redeem your federated token, um, up until the end of uh, the year. And if you don't do it, uh, sorry, uh, you, you don't get your, uh, bitcoins. Uh, I think that's about the best you can do in that sense from like, you know, end of life of an IOU, uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, right. That's also very interesting. What happens when you lose uh, that money certificate, right? The sidechain token. That gives you the ownership right of the on-chain token. <laughs> if if that is lost, well, who gets to actually spend your on-chain parent chain mm. Bitcoin? And mm. the, the federation uh, is there some process set up for this? Some recourse to get your money back? Uh, that seems to be a big unsolved problem. Yeah, I think uh, I think ideally, if you have sufficient privacy, you yeah, I I think I think you just it's just sort of impossible like. I don't think you can prove that you actually lost the coins and that they're yours, right? Because the the evidence that they're yours is the same evidence that allows you to move the coins in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's sort of like what the Craig Wright's uh, claiming that he's Satoshi and he, oops, he lost his keys, right? Like, nobody believes him. So, I think you have this, a similar problem here where, okay, so you lost the, the evidence, the only evidence that is is valid to prove that you actually had the tokens that you had uh, the, the claim to the, these Bitcoin I use, uh, and now we're supposed to believe that you just you know they're actually yours. Um, I I think that just that claim just fails. So I think you just can't. And then I guess the fair thing to do, um, ideally, I guess the federation would say ahead of time if there are any tokens uh, after end of life, we um, destroy them. I guess that would be very fair, but you know, probably more business-like would be just to keep them. Yes, and also the question of are the keys to this output lost, or is this just a person hodling the coins for a very long time? And that looks indistinguishable too of having the optionality to spend but choosing not to, versus not having the keys to spend the coin. And it looks yeah. for an outside observer the same. Yeah, it, it's an unprovable claim. Yeah, so this is really interesting, right? So what will all these sidechain federations do uh, if a lot of the Bitcoin are still on their on-chain multi-signature address, but in the sidechain, the keys are apparently lost and the coins are no longer moving? Yep. Well, I propose that I get all these Bitcoin. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Let's, uh, let's do that. Give it to Max. I agree. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's dive a bit more into the value of these actual tokens. Um, because I think this is something very interesting. Uh, I mean, in general, to me, value is subjective. And then every individual has unique valuations, both across other individuals and across himself, across different points in time. And so today you value a piece of meat, uh, different than yesterday. Um, so to say that, uh, a, the, the sidechain token has the same value as the parent chain block, uh, token seems to be a bit confusing because they're two <laughs> different things, right? One is the real yeah. Bitcoin. The other is the IOU of Bitcoin. And it might have, you know, very different ways of it being able to transact. You know, case example, liquid instead of 10 minute block time, one minute block time. And in, instead of mining, uh, it's signing and instead of you know, the uh, UTXO set, there's uh, confidential transactions and such. So mm-hmm. a lot of actual differences in the good itself, and therefore, presumably, it has a different value. So how do we actually keep that one-to-one pack to Bitcoin? Or is it even necessary? Mm. Yeah, so I think, like, one of the things you're sort of implying, I mean, I, I don't think you're literally implying it, but, like, um, 
it, it's sort of like saying like, well, shouldn't the liquid tokens be worth more because you can do more? You know, like they have they have better functionality. Um, and I think the answer to that is no, because um, you know, you you could compare it to the alternative, which is a, a something a chain like Liquid that is federated but doesn't have a two way peg and instead has its own uh, altcoin. And in that scenario, you wouldn't value the altcoin as much as you would Bitcoin because it's a you know a completely different altcoin that has terrible trust assumptions. Um, so. I think from that perspective, it is always a Bitcoin first. And whatever the extra functionality is, it's just kind of a bonus. And if there is value there, um, I think that value is probably going to be um, absorbed by the Bitcoin price. So let's say we have a healthy ecosystem with lots of uh, Bitcoin side ch- uh, side, uh, yeah, federated sidechains. Then I think the fact that you are able to use your Bitcoins on all these other chains where you can do all these fancy things that you couldn't do on Bitcoin, uh, I think that will just reflect in, in Bitcoin's price going up. Uh, so that's that's kind of the upside of it. Um, but then there's also the downside, right? You could also argue the opposite. You could say like, well, isn't it worse? Because if you have your coins in liquid, uh, these coins might get, uh, you know, they, they might get stolen by the Federation. Uh, the Federation might just mess up and be unable to uh, pay out anymore. Um, so there's kind of an additional risk as well. Uh, so from that perspective, I think it's very hard for the peg to drop, uh, assuming things are okay. Uh, like when things are not okay, uh, definitely. Like if, if there's like uh, uh, suddenly there's uh, uncertainty about whether or not uh, you can peg out your coins, people are going to start selling them at a discount. And this is what happened to Mt. Gox as well, or just sort of a secondary market where the price on Mt. Gox was much lower because nobody wanted to, you know, everybody wanted to hold uh, fiat over. Uh, over these bitcoins that were probably fractional on there. Um, so something like that could definitely happen. But as long as, uh, the federation itself has, um, is certain that the coins aren't lost, then they can just act on that market, right? And they can just say, like, look, okay, well, if you want to sell your, your liquid bitcoin for a discount for 0.99, 0.98, sure, uh, I'll buy them because I know I'm going to get them out. Um, so it's just an arbitrage opportunity for them. And yeah, that's also kind of a weird thing because now you get into uh, sort of uh, mor- morally uh, um, questionable uh, uh, territory, which is something that sort of happened to Bitfinex, where with Bitfinex, they had this token uh, that was supposed to make uh, investors whole. And you have this uncertainty on the markets, and there's a lot more certainty or there's a lot more knowledge on the inside uh, in Bitfinex. So Bitfinex can... Uh, so, are you actually familiar with the, uh, the Bitfinex token and how that went, or should I explain it a little better? Yeah, maybe go into some of the gist of it. Yeah, so I, I don't fully, uh, I'm not sure if I get the details right, but it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll just kind of at a high level uh, explain that uh, Bitfinex was insolvent, and so basically they gave everybody sort of a, um, uh, they said like, we don't know if we can make you solvent or not, uh, but here is. Um, sort of a claim to the degree to which, uh, to, to, you know, to that future, uh, payback. So maybe we'll be solvent and you can get your coins back, or maybe we won't be and then you can't get your coins back. So you can trade that token, that, that, the token where we're not certain. Uh, and so people did and people sold it at a discount. And then eventually, um, I think Bitfinex on that m- market itself bought back, uh, the tokens. At a discount in order to become solvent. And that's sort of like morally questionable because you, like they created the uncertainty. And the more uncertain people are, the more discount they, they can sell. Uh, so there was an incentive for Bitfinex to be like, Hey, uh, yeah, I don't know if we're going to be solvent. It looks pretty bad, guys. Uh, and then the price drops and then they buy their tokens and then they're solvent again. So it's like, it's the same thing for liquid, right? Like turning it back to liquid, maybe that's the easier example. Where if there isn't, uh, if like theoretically liquid, the federation could profit from uncertainty and just say like, oh, I don't know, guys, maybe we're not solvent. Uh, I mean, that's not a very good business decision, but I'm just pointing it out that's possible. Um, then the price, you know, people start uh, panicking and, uh, they might sell their liquid Bitcoin at a discount and then the federation buys those at a discount and now they made a profit. So yeah, it's it's weird stuff like that that 
you know, just, I don't know, makes me worry uh, for the future, I guess, because these things are possible and they're very hard to regulate. Yes, and I think as a benefit, we really have a lot of historical uh, case studies in very similar grounds, again, with gold banking. Uh, and Murray Rothbard wrote quite prolifically on, on how this works. And again, fundamentally, that uh, if you have a money warehouse, meaning that you deposit actual money species, and then receive in exchange this money certificate right, that gives you a claim on that money to be immediately uh, withdrawn from the bank. And right? uh, then oftentimes this claim on money trades at par to the money. So like one liquid Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin because officially you can redeem one liquid Bitcoin for one Bitcoin on chain uh, whenever you like. And right? so, and in a, let's say, uh, in, in a good market environment where there's no uncertainty and where everyone is convinced that you can actually get one real Bitcoin out of in exchange for this one sidechain token, um, then this pack would hold. But yes, as there is uncertainty and as people are leaning towards more likely selling uh, the sidechain token rather than buying it, then yes, this pack is absolutely not certain and not baked in stone. And specifically when there are illiquidities in the pack in and pack out, um, which I think is important to not underestimate, right? Because again, what you're holding in the side chain is definitely not Bitcoin, uh, and therefore has to be uh, regarded uh, differently. Yep. Yeah. Um, but but nevertheless, right? A compare this to having a custodian, uh, like a single custodian money warehouse. Right, like like most custodianships are today, most exchanges just you know are the only person that can spend the Bitcoin on chain. And this is apparently a lot more reckless than this federated custodianship. Right? So yeah. apparently it reduces the, the risk and uncertainty, therefore making it more of an at par money certificate. Yeah. Uh, that's that's very interesting. But then there is space chains, and space chains is different from other side chains in the way that it is only a one-way peg, so that you can s destroy Bitcoin and create uh, these sidechain tokens, but <laughs> yeah. you cannot peg out of the sidechain, meaning you cannot destroy the sidechain tokens and get back the on-chain parent chain Bitcoin. Uh, so how does this work, and why is this a different model? Yeah, uh, okay, so... Uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of work uh, on uh, sidechains, and so what we've discussed so far is kind of federated sidechains, but I have, you know, a bunch of proposals that are kind of different from that. So space chains is uh, definitely like a good one to start with because I mentioned it a couple of times already. Um, so there, there are two parts about space chains. So the first part is actually um, getting consensus over another blockchain inside of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so what you can do is you can do something uh, called blind merge mining. Uh, and I created kind of a method to do that with regular Bitcoin transactions, where essentially when you want to create a block on this other chain, which I call a space chain, you have to put the hash of that block into the Bitcoin blockchain, and you have to compete with others to put that hash there. And then whoever pays the highest uh, amount of fees, a uh, Bitcoin fees to Bitcoin miners, they get to put their hash there. Um, and so this sort of simulates uh, Bitcoin's proof of work, uh, but inside of the Bitcoin blockchain for another chain. So given that you have this mechanism, uh, you now can create um, chains inside of the Bitcoin blockchain that basically don't require their own proof of work, but instead... Uh, they pay fees to Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin, uh, miners, they turn those fees into, into Bitcoin's proof of work. So it's sort of, um, you know, you could, you, every, every altcoin could theoretically do this where instead of having their own proof of work, they just live inside of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and it's all kind of under the umbrella of Bitcoin's proof of work. So that's the first step. But so far, what I've described is, is literally an altcoin, right? You have just this completely different chain. Uh, with, uh, where you still need to have some kind of native token inside of there, uh, because if you don't have a token, uh, you can't do anything. Uh, and that's kind of the beauty of, of Bitcoin, right? Where, uh, the Bitcoin tokens themselves kind of act also as the mechanism to pay for fees to create transactions. Um, so that's where the part that you explained comes in. Um, 
So the way I solve this is with uh, what I call a perpetual one-way tag. And this is literally what you said. Uh, you can burn or destroy Bitcoins in order to create uh, what I call space coins. And this mechanism allows you to basically move your move from the Bitcoin blockchain to the space chain. And because you can always do this, because it's a perpetual peg, so meaning that if you want to do this like five years from now, uh, you, you can do it then, or if you want to do it right now, you can do it right now. Um, but you can never move back. Uh, this actually makes it so that these space coins are inferior to Bitcoin, and that is really important. Uh, because that basically makes it so that speculation is impossible. If you think this uh, space chain is amazing and very useful, there's still no reason why you would move all your Bitcoins over. That's still a terrible idea. Uh, really, if it's amazing and very useful, uh, all that you want is to just use it what it's good for. And in order to use it, you have to have at least some space coins um, so that's really uh, what the value of the space coins is. So the assumption is only if the space chain is useful and people actually want to put transactions on there, uh, then only then will there be demand for these coins. And this is very different from how altcoins function because an altcoin functions uh, more, uh, you know, similar to um, there, there's this idea that they think like, okay, well, in the future, lots of people are going to have uh, are going to use this chain. Therefore, there's going to be lots of demand for uh, these coins. Therefore, the value is going to go up. Therefore, I'm going to buy the token now when the value is still low. And then the price shoots up and people speculate and there's a pump and dump. So that's entirely impossible here. If you think in the future, lots of people are going to use the space chain and they're going to want to have these space coins uh, in order to pay for fees, there's no reason to buy them now. Uh, because there is no way to speculate on it. You can buy now one space coin for one Bitcoin, and you can do that five years from now. Um, so speculation is just impossible. And, and that's why I think it's very fundamental. The, these chains can become chains that are, um, useful to the Bitcoin ecosystem. Because in reality, what you're doing if you create an altcoin is you're creating a competitor to Bitcoin and a competitor to Bitcoin is not something that you can see as being useful uh, for for uh, you know accompanying Bitcoin or, or helping uh, uh, you know Bitcoin's value grow. So so for example, what you could do with one of these chains is you could create a completely separate chain for um, asset issuance. So some, something similar to Liquid, uh, but then not with a federation, but a completely decentralized chain, and people could use that to issue rare Pepe's or, or things like that. Uh, and it will be a completely separate chain with separate block space. So it's kind of like an opt-in thing. Um, so you don't have as much a fee pressure as you have on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and, and that is valuable to Bitcoin. But if you do that with an altcoin, you're really, what you're really saying is, Oh, this altcoin is better than Bitcoin. So people should speculate on its value. And, and you start competing, right? You're, you're competing with Bitcoin, but the space coin itself makes it literally impossible. So now you actually can have a chain where you know for a fact that the chain is not trying to take away, you know, Bitcoin's store of value, a thunder through, uh, you know, illicit marketing campaigns or, you know, all the, all the, all the bad stuff that altcoins do because it's just literally made impossible. And that enables you to create any kind of chain you want, uh, that exists purely to kind of help out the Bitcoin ecosystem where you have a literal guarantee that there's actually no way in which this chain is trying to compete with Bitcoin store of value. Um, the one caveat to that is it's a one-way peg. It's not a place where you can store your value. So any use case on this chain has to be a, a use case that is not one where that requires people to want to store their value in a decentralized way on this chain. You can always store your value through a two-way peg on this chain, but a, a federated two-way peg. Um, but then you involve a federation, so that's that's kind of cheating. Uh, what we're trying to do here is do it completely decentralized. So there's no way, because it's a one-way peg, not a two-way peg. There's no way to store your value and uh, you know have lots of money on there uh, and then send it to others, but for small amounts and for uh, things like asset issuance, 
uh, and uh, maybe a two-way pack, federated two-way pack tokens, things like that. Uh, it can be a very uh, useful uh, thing, and you can do other things. You can do DNS, like anything, any use case. You know, there are a lot of altcoins out there that claim that they're not trying to be a store of value, um, but they have their own token, and they try to solve some kind of problem that you know may or may not be valid. Like I think a lot of them aren't valid, but some of them, like DNS, might be valid. Uh, you can do that without an altcoin now, and I think that's inherently very valuable. Yeah, this is extremely interesting and for sure very novel, but I'm not so sure if your reasoning checks out because, or let's, let's walk through it step by step. So if, if I have one Bitcoin and I want to today get some space chains, uh, space chain coins, then how do I get to that exchange rate of one Bitcoin for one space chain coin? Who defines that? So that is literally, um, so very similar to what I was talking about earlier with the, the peg-ins, right? Like the peg-in on a federated chain being automated. It's the same thing here. Uh, so there's no issuer. It, it, it's literally that the space chain itself is aware of Bitcoin's consensus. So the moment that you destroy one Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, you're automatically credited one, uh, one space coin on the space chain. Okay. And this peg is kind of enforced by the node software of that space chain. Yes, yeah, it's literally a consensus rule. So whenever a Bitcoin gets destroyed, a one space chain gets created. Okay, I see. And so if, like, but this, this ratio could, for example, change if there were a consensus fork for the space chain. If you create a hard fork, you can change any consensus rule you like. Yes. <laughs> uh huh. Yes, I see. Okay. And then how, like, once I have that one space coin, who or how do I figure out how much I can actually use it? Like, it does, for example, the, uh, if I can use it to pay for transaction fees, then the, the value of the virtual bytes in the, that block are kind of what I can spend the, uh, those coins on. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Right, but then if the block, like if the supply here is somewhat limited, let's just assume for arguing that it is, yeah, and and the demand of the, uh, of using that block space increases, then effectively the the value of that space chain token actually increases, maybe even above one bitcoin. Uh, yes and no, because uh, it it will go up, and the moment it goes up, there's an incentive to burn more bitcoins to create more space coins. Because um, let's say let's say the price goes up, right? So one one space coin is worth one point one bitcoin. Well, then you burn one Bitcoin, you create one space coin, you sell the space coin, and now you, you, you gained 0.1 Bitcoin. Yeah. So here that arbitrage works because we can always burn more Bitcoin and get exactly. more space chains, uh, space chain coins, right? But then what would happen if it's on the other side? Uh, let's say we have a hundred Bitcoin already packed into the space chain. But now the demand for space chain size or block space decreases and yep. people are selling their space chain tokens even below par, right? They just want to get rid of them very fast. Absolutely. That can totally happen. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me walk you through that scenario. Um, so the first thing is it's not a store of value token. So anybody who was holding onto their space coins thinking that they were going to store their value, uh, made a mistake. Uh, that is literally not what you, uh, what, what it's designed for, right? So you have to, at the very least, expect that the price might go down. Um, the second thing is that it's, uh, it's sort of an unlikely scenario. Well, it's, it's a possible scenario, but it's, it, before the price can go down, right? Demand first has to be high. So demand has to go up, uh, go up significantly and then go back down again in order for this to happen. And there is no, at, at the very least, there is no altcoin uh, pump and dump event here uh, that could allow for this to happen. So really, what would have to happen first is there is an actual valid reason for which people want to use the block space. And then later, uh, that reason uh, disappears. Um, mm. Because if there wasn't a valid reason, nobody would have burned their Bitcoins. Um, so, so that makes that scenario less likely to occur. But... Uh, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right that it's entirely possible. Uh, and the price could 
definitely go down below uh, the value of one Bitcoin. Um, and to me, that is just perfectly acceptable because the way I see it is that, okay, so now the token is worth less. So now, buddy, nobody's going to uh, be burning any Bitcoins anymore. But there are still tokens in the system. And there is some speculation possible at that point, right? Because somebody could try and speculate on the fact that maybe they go back up to being worth one Bitcoin. Um, but still, that level of speculation is nothing compared to what happens to altcoins. So I, I see that as a perfectly uh, acceptable scenario where now you have a bunch of coins that still can never be worth more than one Bitcoin, but uh, are, are worth uh, maybe significantly less even. Um, and people are just using those tokens now to pay for block space. Uh, so that's basically how I see it. Uh, it's acceptable. It is, I, uh, you know, the design makes it so that it's not likely for that to happen easily, but it could totally happen. Um, and the space chain continues to function uh, when that happens. Yes, that's interesting. But uh, what if you combine that with the with the aspect that Bitcoin tends to increase in value? So let's say if you would have burned one Bitcoin for one space chain coin 10 years ago, right? that would have been much less value that you would have packed into the side chain compared to yeah. if you would do it now. Yeah. Uh, no, that's actually very interesting that you bring that up. Um, because, okay, so this is kind of a weird one, but um, the demand for block space is not, um, it, it's separate from uh, the demand for, uh, yeah, so, so basically what you're pointing out here is that Bitcoin will go up in value. And when Bitcoin goes up in value, there is, uh, f for the space, for the, the space coins to still be worth one Bitcoin, uh, those space coins would have to go up in value, but the space coins don't necessarily go up in value when Bitcoin goes up in value. The space coins only go up in value when there's more demand for block space. And that's not the same thing. Um, so. I find it very difficult to predict predict what would happen in this scenario, but uh, what you actually might end up with is a token that, assuming um, assuming that the the demand for block space is relatively stable, uh, this token would also have a relatively stable value. Um, that is, you know, I I don't know like whether or not you can get to a scenario where. Uh, where demand for block space is relatively stable, but that's something that we're trying to get to in Bitcoin, right? You can imagine a scenario where in Bitcoin in the future, um, block space is just very clearly valued at a certain price, and maybe it's at a premium at certain times and, and a little bit lower at, at other times. Um, but the space coin would actually follow that, uh, would follow that type of value, right? So, it might actually end up being a very um, stable coin in terms of uh, maybe if you look at the fiat denominated price of, of this token. So it will go down in value compared to Bitcoin, um, but it might actually um, become uh, yeah sort of like more stable than than Bitcoin is both in the upside and the downside. Uh, but this is uh, you know very speculative. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, and I think the the more uh, you know pessimistic way of looking at it is that. Yeah, so the tokens will go down in value and they'll be worth less than one Bitcoin uh, and the system still continues to work. Um, I think that's, you know, that's absolutely fine too. But I'm actually, yeah, I'm kind of interested in in how that might play out. So the space chain tokens are created when Bitcoins are burned. But when do space chain tokens get burned too? Um, so, so the simplest design uh, doesn't actually have any, well, they're, they're, yeah, so, so they're, they're two, generally speaking, they won't get burned, but there are two reasons why you might burn them. Um, so the first reason is you can have a space chain inside of a space chain. And then in order to get space coins inside of that second space chain, you need to burn space coins on the first, uh, space chain. So that would be one reason to burn these coins. And that's also sort of interesting, right? Because, what that means is that any chain that is created on the on the layer below it will sort of create demand for the layer above it, uh, for the chain above it. Um, so that that that's kind of a faucet, right? Where where space coins exit, and if you have kind of a uh, a way for space coins to gradually disappear out of the system, that could also theoretically help stabilize the price or, or keep it closer to uh, one bitcoin, right? Where 
Uh, so some coins enter the system, but because some coins also exit the system through burning, um, maybe you could create some kind of spy, uh, price equilibrium where, you know, eventually there are not enough space coins again and people have to burn bitcoins again. And, and that way you can keep it sort of close to, uh, a, 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 you know, one to one peg. Again, never guaranteed, uh, but there is some potential there. Uh, but the main way of doing that, that's interesting. Um, is, is not by creating another space chain inside of a space chain, but you can actually have a consensus rule inside of a space chain that says with every block, a Bitcoin miner has to burn uh, a certain percentage of all the uh, available space coins. Uh, so that might be like 0.01% or something that comes down to, I think, roughly 10% per year. Um, so you know for a fact that with every block being created, uh, some space coins are exiting the system. Uh, and, and this could kind of create a sort of a, um, price stability, um, where maybe, uh, the, the space coins could sort of stay closer to, uh, to the Bitcoin value. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to do. Uh, but I think, like, again, this is very hard to predict. Uh, but I think this would only be practical in a scenario where you create a space chain that is meant for low value Bitcoin payments. So still, you don't expect anyone to store their value there, but people sort of use it as a way to, I don't know, do their day-to-day groceries or something. Um, and you know that uh, these, you know, there's there's sort of a cost to it because the the space coins uh, also get destroyed. Uh, but because you're using it not as a store of value, but as a, a medium of exchange primarily, you're sort of willing to make that trade off. Uh, so I think there might be some uh, interesting uh, potential there. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's very hard. And I, I think, you know, just, you know, have me having explained it to you, you probably, you know, are going through it in your head and wondering like, Hmm, uh, how does this all work? Uh, it, it, it is quite complex, but I do see a lot of potential there. And I think it sort of like needs to be experimented with. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious, curious what you think so far. It's, it's for sure an incredibly novel concept because previously right with with these federated two-way peg side chains again it's basically a money warehouse right someone else pays attention and care over your on-chain bitcoin and gives you some token or certificate in exchange for that uh but but here or the downside of this approach is that of course that trusted third party the federation can run off of your on-chain bitcoin and you will never see them again yeah Um, and if we want to so, okay, so one step is uh, federating this. So instead of trusting one person, trust a threshold group of a per, uh, group of persons, right? So 11 out of 15 or whatever. But of course, much better would be if there is, if there's no way for anyone to take away the Bitcoin that you put into that uh, money warehouse. And space chains is kind of the realization, okay, screw it. We don't want this two way peg. We don't ever want to get Bitcoin out of this. Uh, uh, space ch- or side chain again. It's not a money warehouse, but rather we're paying here for a service, maybe in a sense. Yeah. Uh, well, but if you pay for a service, then a counterparty gets your money, right? And here, who gets the money? The big <laughs> money you burn? Well, nobody. Yeah. No, uh, somebody does get the money. It's a good question. Um, so the person getting the money is every other Bitcoiner. Um, so the better the space chain does, the more Bitcoins get burned, the more Bitcoins get burned, the more scarce your Bitcoins are, uh, the, the people who didn't burn. Um, so it is actually, um, basically whenever a space coin is created, um, the Bitcoiners basically get that value and the existing space coin holders are paying that value because if, the, if new space coins weren't going to be created, then the space coins would go up in value. So, uh, but it's, it's acceptable because space coins only get created when they exceed one Bitcoin. And space coin holders should already be happy when their space coins are just worth one Bitcoin. Uh, and so they're, they're giving up, they're giving up everything over one Bitcoin. If the space coin becomes worth more than one Bitcoin, none of the space coin own- owners are ever going to see that money. But all the Bitcoiners are receiving that money because more Bitcoins get burned. Yeah, that is very, very fascinating. Yeah. In a sense, it really does put kind of an upper cap of the value of the token, just 
or assuming that there is arbitrage opportunity, right? Assuming that there is a flourishing market where people do not pack into the, the sidechain, but actually swap into and out of the sidechain. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, this is sorcery. I think your title is quite fitting. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm, yeah, like, the, the, and the, but that's the thing. This is a lot of kind of assumptions and how will people act and how will they trade yeah. these yeah. scarce assets. And yeah, predicting monkeys is difficult. It is very difficult. But the nice thing is that, like, even at the worst case scenario level where the token just doesn't hold much value and just goes down and it plummets, that's fine too. It still works. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like scenarios that are maybe nice where it can sort of hold a one to one pack value. Uh, but those are really just a cherry on top, uh, from my perspective. Like if they don't work, it's still a useful system. And, uh, but it, it's worth experimenting with these methods. And just kind of like seeing, you know, how, how far we can, we can take these, these concepts. Um, and you know, so you know, there, there's one argument that is, is very like related that I've been like having with lots of people where, um, you know, a lot of Ethereum proponents make this argument. Uh, and I've, I've had it with, uh, you know, some other altcoin people. Um, but they argue that their token has value, not because it's a store of value, like, like it'll take Ethereum, right? Like with Ethereum, a lot of people, they argue Ethereum is gas. Uh, Ethereum can do all these, these amazing smart contract things. And because of these amazing smart contract things that you can do with Ethereum, ETH, the token has value. It's not because Ethereum is such a great store of value. Uh, no, not at all. It's because of all these amazing smart contract things. And, uh, so that's the arguments. And I, I personally, I think the argument is false. Uh, I think the only way an altcoin can have value is if people want to store their value there first and foremost. Um, you know, if you want to do things like use it as collateral, uh, or use it for weird smart contracts, uh, the, the thing first needs to have value before you actually want to, like, th there's no value in using a, a token without value in a smart contract, right? So, so the value has to come first. It has to have value. Uh, and, and then you can, you know, with that valuable thing, you can do all kinds of cool things. Um, but let's say I'm wrong with that argument. Um, if I am wrong, then whatever this value is, that is not just storing value, uh, this value can be captured with space chains and this can be put to use, uh, for Bitcoin in, in service of Bitcoin in a way where it's not competing as a store of value, quite literally. Um, so, you know, if, if that's, you know, altcoin, uh, claim is true and you can create value without the token itself being a store of value, uh, then you can do it on space chains. But again, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I question the claim. I, w I would actually say that space chain tokens are in fact the store of value. Um, just b because store of value and medium of exchange and even unit of account are for me inherently intertwined. So, like, money is that thing mm. that you exchange for production goods or consumption goods. I didn't, uh, so in the sense of, let's say, the Bitcoin base layer blockchain, um, Bitcoin, like, money, the Satoshis you spend in order to consume Bitcoin block, blo uh, block space. And this is the fee that you actually spend to get your transactions into the Bitcoin blockchain. And here, Bitcoin is obviously your direct medium of exchange to pay for the service that you receive and getting confirmed in Bitcoin blocks. Um, the same with buying a pizza, right? You spend your money, you sacrifice your Bitcoin in order that the other person gives you the pizza. And so here, the, the medium of exchange is, uh, is obviously there. But why do you hold Bitcoin today, right? Why do you save your Bitcoin today? Why don't you today, right now, spend all of your Bitcoin on pizza? Well, that is because you want, or because you are uncertain about what you might want to have in the future, and therefore you store the value that you're having today uh, in order to spend it on potential consumption or production in the future. So just by the fact of saving something and not investing it or consuming it today, it, it just means uh, by uh, deduction uh, or um, uh, negation, that in fact you are holding your value. So as, as soon as you save, as soon as you huddle 10 space uh, chain coins, 
without actually making space chain transactions, then in fact, you do store your value in space chain coins. And you yeah. estimate that in the future, you will use this value to actually consume it uh, mm -hmm. and to, to use block space then. Yeah. So actually, I agree with you. Um, I think the, the reason I say it's not a store of value is not because it's literally not a store of value. Uh, you're, you're sort of right that everything is a store of value, right? Um, but because Bitcoin is the superior store of value. So really, the question isn't, can you store uh, 10 space coins on a space chain? Uh, the question is, would you rather store 10 space coins on a space chain or would you rather store 10 Bitcoins on the Bitcoin blockchain? And I think the answer is you'd rather store uh, Bitcoins. And, and that makes the demand for space coins in terms of store value a zero. Uh, I mean, maybe not literally zero because uh, th there is some utility there, right? Uh, clearly. So, uh, but, but the, um, in terms of long term storing value, Bitcoin is superior. Therefore, uh, you're not going to use space coins for that use case. Uh, therefore, Anyone who tries to use it for that use case is going to find that nobody else uh, values it like they 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 were valuing it. Um, so I guess that's that's kind of how I look at it. It's a uh, the inferior store value will never be used for storing value because the superior one wins. I I, th I think I agree with you on the macro view that most individuals will prefer to store their value in Bitcoin compared to some space chain token. However, I don't think it's like a praxeological truth because there can be individuals that do value space chain tokens over Bitcoin. Right? And we see that by those who, who burn Bitcoin to get space chain tokens or who even swap or, or trade their space chain tokens for Bitcoin on a secondary market. And so here we have people who do value space chain tokens more than Bitcoin tokens. Yeah, and I think that's primarily um, the... Uh the fact that this the block space has value so really it's not the space coins they value it's the it's the block space on the space chain that they value and this block space can only be bought practically speaking i mean there are impractical ways to do it in our, uh, 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 differently but practically speaking they can only be bought with space coins um there is an argument though like to in, in, to to your point right um you could argue that bitcoin is bad for low value decentralized payments and maybe people do want to do low value decentralized payments and therefore they are willing to store some value again low value but some value in the space chain and use it for that purpose to just make smaller payments to people uh, but that also sort of assumes that the space chain itself isn't hugely popular and gets high fees uh, but you can create as many spaces as you like so that's sort of like you know it's possible um, so maybe there is like sort of like a niche, right? Where there is, there are some, there's one clear reason, which is block space, right? If the block space is useful, you want to have some of these tokens. You, you want to store some, some tokens to create some of these transactions. Um, and, and then maybe, yeah, there, are, maybe there are a few secondary things here and there. Um, but at the very least, yeah, if those exist, now you no longer need an altcoin and you could do it via space chains at the benefit of Bitcoin. Yeah, this is interesting, right? That if you want to use the block space of the space chain, then you do need to spend with space chain tokens. Same as if you want to make a Bitcoin transaction, you do need to spend mining fees with Bitcoin. I mean, I, yeah, you can spend the mine, uh, or like pay the miner out of band, you know, with ice cream or kisses or whatnot, <laughs> yeah. right? But that's not kind of the designed way of doing it. And, and it's actually a very impractical way of doing it because I looked at that design design as well. Like before I came up with, like originally, you know, I started off with this consensus mechanism of blind merge mining. And then I was like, oh, oh shit, this needs a token. And does it need an altcoin? Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how I got, how I got there. But initially I was kind of hoping I could create a chain that doesn't require a native token at all. Um, and my conclusion just ended up being that no, it's too difficult. Like, you know, I looked at like, oh, maybe you can do it via the Lightning Network and pay miners that way. But, you know, you, like it, it actually gave me a lot of um, uh, like the, the design that Satoshi came up with <laughs> was like I realized like how uh, ingenious it was because mm -hmm. the fee paying structure is a it's a non-interactive way to pay miners. 
you don't know who your miner is going to be. You just create a transaction. Anyone can take the transaction out of the P2P network, put it into a block, and claim the transaction for themselves if they cr- are able to create a valid block. And once you go out of band, you lose that non-interactiveness. And instead, you've got to talk to every miner. Uh, you cannot make a payment that's atomic, right? One where, well, maybe through some trickery you can, but it's very difficult. It's where you say like, oh, the miner only gets paid if they put my transaction in. And then when they put the transaction in, um, that's like a specific miner that you had a deal with or that you, know, that you were talking to. But if there's some kind of new miner, like that new, how is the new miner going to enter the market if nobody, you know, n- knows about them? So it's, uh, it just adds a ton of compl- uh, complexity. It's not literally impossible, but it's just so much easier to have this non-interactive process. So that's really, uh, yeah, that's really something that Satoshi solved that in hindsight is actually quite significant. Yes, absolutely. Right, that the transaction fee pays anonymous miners. Uh, to include this transaction into a block is, is, is amazing because that is actually what provides censorship resistance. Right? The way that anonymous transactors can pay anonymous miners money for the service of confirming their transactions, uh, is, is, yes, is, is mind blowing. Really yeah. Is. Yeah. And I guess theoretically you could try and do it over Tor, blah, blah, blah. Like, yes, but it just, it just gets infinitely more complex. Like non-interactive systems are just beautiful. Like they just work, right? It's very easy. Just you aggregate everything and you just put it together and you're done. Uh, and that's how Bitcoin fees work. It, it, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is kind of, you know, you hinted on that just a second ago, but it's so difficult to have a, a, like the true Bitcoin in a, in a second layer. Like, uh, you know, in the federated sidechain, like liquid, the liquid Bitcoin are an IOU on real Bitcoin. So not really the same thing. As for space chains, again, here, this, the space chain token is very different from the actual Bitcoin. But you, you still need some type of token in this uh, second layer sidechain. And so yeah. d- do you ever think, or what do you think is missing to come up with that idea to have, you know, pure Bitcoin as the only token on a sidechain? Well, I happen to have a solution for that as well, <laughs> which is called soft chains. Uh, so, uh, maybe intentional or not, your, your, uh, uh, at least that's, that's the answer to your question. So very generally speaking, um, and this is like what happened when the, uh, uh, the, so Blockstream released the sidechains paper late 2014, I want to say. Um, and they had this idea of, um, of creating Sidechains that are not federated. Uh, federated was kind of sort of a, uh, a footnotes or a, uh, appendix, uh, addition to that paper. But originally they wanted to create these chains that would communicate to each other through so-called SPV, uh, proofs. Um, so in theory, the way I would say it is that if the main chain is able to validate the state of a sidechain, in such a way that it costs them almost no bandwidth or effort, then you can create a sidechain system that is decentralized. Uh, but this is very similar to the uh, full node problem, where if the sidechain, if the if the main chain is able to validate the sidechain without doing a lot of effort, it would also mean that a, uh, a sidechain uh, user would be able to do full node like validation without a lot of effort. And, and that, you know, that is generally speaking not true. Uh, do, do you sort of like see the analogy here or, or did I not explain it very clearly? Yeah, I, um, you know, but with the issue that the, or similar with space chains, right? In, in space chains, you, if you are in a side chain, let's say layer two, then you do need to verify layer one in order to be able to to trust or, or to use that space chain. Yeah. Uh, but you can build further layers on top, right? So you can sp- build a space chain on top of a space chain on top of the parent ba- uh, parent blockchain. Yeah. And if you only use layer two, you don't need to verify layer three at all. But if you verify, if you want to use layer three, then you need yep. to verify the parent layer and layer two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and so once you get a two-way peg, now you create a circle, right? Because you now you're saying um, layer three needs to validate layer two and layer one. Uh, but layer one also needs to somehow know the state of layer two and layer three. 
you go both you go in both directions basically. So the only way you would be able to go in both directions is if one of these directions is very cheap. So if somehow you were able to allow for layer one to validate layer two in a way that's extremely efficient, then you could do it. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you know, that's a hard problem to solve. Uh, and so SPV proofs were kind of a solution to that, right? Because an, S an SPV proof, what it, what it is, is it just says, we go and we make an assumption. We say that if you show me the headers of a blockchain, uh, I can val validate that these headers were very expensive to create. And then if you show me a transaction inside of one of these headers, I'm just going to assume it's valid. Because if it, somebody apparently put a lot of effort into creating these headers with this transaction inside, and if this, tra if this transaction isn't valid, then somebody did all this effort without, you know, just basically just to fool me. Uh, and that seems economically irrational because these headers are so darn expensive. Um, so that's sort of the, the assumption that the original sidechain paper tried to work on. Uh, and it turns out that that assumption is, is very much unsafe. Because what you end up doing is uh, when a pegout occurs, right? So when you want to move from the sidechain to the, the main chain, um, you you basically show all these sidechain headers to the main chain and you say like, look, a lot of work was performed to create these blocks. And one of these blocks contains a pegout transaction. And uh, now you're going to wait a while. So even more blocks get created on top of it. And then once you've uh, waited long enough, uh, you're just going to assume that because miners created all this proof of work on the sidechain, it's just valid. But this creates an incentive cliff where you can basically, uh, let's say it takes, um, let's say it takes, uh, uh, three months to do the pegouts or something. That means that the sidechain miners, if they're able to create a chain that's three months long, they can take all the coins. So that's the incentive cliff. The, uh, the coins inside of the sidechain system cannot be, uh, if there, if there are more coins than what it costs to create three months worth of proof of work, which generally speaking seems likely, then, uh, the system is, is not secure, basically. Yeah. So, so here basically, as soon as you can provide sufficient proof of work below a certain target threshold of the sidechain, Right? So you, you only provide the proof of work off the side chain. Then you can prove to the parent chain verifier that here is a pack out transaction on the side chain that has sufficient proof of work. Yeah. And it's a, it's sort of like the assumption is it has a, a ton of proof of work. Therefore it must be valid. And, and that's a, that's a dangerous assumption, right? Because just that because it has a lot of proof of work doesn't actually mean it's valid. Uh, but that's the assumption it operates on, and that's the assumption it fails on. Uh, if, if the, um, if a ton of proof of work was just done in order to create an, uh, an invalid peg out, and literally this, this could be a transaction that just takes out all the coins, right? All, all the, uh, all the coins that are inside of the system get taken back out, uh, into the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, if that was the case, um, then this would just get blindly accepted. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's generally the weakness of this system. Uh huh. I see. And so how does Velvet, uh, or sorry, how does, uh, what's it called? So no, not soft forks. Yeah. Soft chains. Soft chains, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's all these names. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot. And, uh, they all start with an S, make it extra confusing. Uh, that's also why, uh, that's, uh, that's why the word sorcerer I thought was appropriate because it also starts with an S. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and Samson, my last name, so it all fits. Um, anyway, yes. So soft chains are actually a solution to this problem. Um, so what soft chains try to do is they try to fix this 51% minor assumption, right? The assumption that says like, look, if, um, if 51% of all the miners, if the majority of the miners created all this proof of work, it must be valid, right? That's the assumption. That's the unsafe assumption. So with soft chains, we actually have a, a better than SPV way of validating a chain. And the way it works is that consensus is, is, is slow, 
but it's uh it's very low bandwidth. And what you do is you make use of forks in the Bitcoin blockchain. So what you what you do is basically you let every uh main the main chain user validates every soft chain. So every every uh you know what we call the side chain, I, I call a soft chain in, in this system. Every soft chain is validated, but it's validated through this low bandwidth uh slow validation method. And this low bandwidth slow validation method is similar to SPV, it takes all the headers and it just checks them. So that's the first step. But then the second step is that it also looks for forks. So let's say you have a chain and it is just one, two, three, four, five, five blocks long. And then suddenly a, a fork appears, another block three appears. So there's a block three B, let's say. Wait, a quick question here. Uh, yeah. Like, where do I actually get the information that a fork happened? Yeah. Because I think in current Bitcoin, like full nodes don't remember forks. Yeah. So the first thing is that um, the fork it, here in 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 this uh, this mechanism that I'm about to describe is the the fork is the valid ch- chain generally speaking. Um. Um. Yeah, that's probably yeah. Let's see. How do I explain it clearly? Um. Okay. So so maybe uh, uh, the easier way of explaining it, and I'll I'll get to the more complicated way after that. Uh, the easier way of explaining it is that. Bitcoin proof of work is expensive to create, and that is what allows it to be peer to peer verifiable. Uh, if you want to send somebody all the block headers, that is not a DOS vector, right? It's, you can't attack someone <laughs> with sending the block headers because block headers are expensive to create. So, so if you want to try and waste someone's bandwidth by creating lots of block headers, well, good luck, right? Like it, it's going to be a very expensive thing to do. Um, so, even though for Bitcoin, uh, you know what you what you're generally doing is you're only receiving the proof of work headers of the of the actual valid most proof of work chain, and the others, you know, people don't bother. Um, in this system, you do bother, uh, and and these these um, these block headers do get sent sent over. Um, but as as you'll see in a minute, it actually ends up just kind of working exactly the same as Bitcoin. But that's a little bit harder to explain, but. I think the easier way of, of thinking about it is just assume that all the block headers will be sent to everybody. Uh, and, and even though that's not even necessary, um, that is, uh, that is how you can think of it. All right. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move forward with the explanation. So we had a block one, two, three, four, five, and then we have a block three B. And so once this fork occurs, this fork is actually a signal, a potential signal that block three in the most proof of work chain might be invalid because this, this miner who created block three B, he chose not to build on top of block five for some reason. Instead, he forked off, right? He forked off from block two to an, an alternate block three, block three B. Um, so you could use that as a signal to say, hmm, what if this miner did this deliberately? Because according to him, block three is invalid. So then, if you can download and validate block three, you can actually check this claim. Um, so you download and you validate block three. And if you find out that block three is valid, well, then great. Uh, you just continue uh, using the, the, the most proof of work blockchain. But if block three is invalid, now you have to reject block three and therefore block four and therefore block five. And then you continue uh, on 3B. Um, so it allows for a way, uh, by spot checking wherever there is a fork, uh, to figure out whether or not, even though a chain is the most proof of work, as long as there's one single block that is actually validly being mined, uh, in this case, block 3B, right? Like if you assume block 3 is invalid, block 3B is the valid block. Um, as long as one valid block is being mined, even the most proof of work chain will get invalidated. And, and this is the, uh, the consensus mechanism that we use, uh, to create actual sidechains. Um, and so one thing to add here, uh, and, uh, maybe then you'll probably, uh, should summarize what I've been saying. Uh, but because block three is the, uh, 3B is the valid one, even in the Bitcoin blockchain, you, the assumption is that at least the valid proof of work will be passed on by your peers. So, 
if there's nobody malicious, if you have no malicious peers, then in reality, you wouldn't even learn about block three, four, and five, right? You would only learn about one, two, and then three B. Um, so it's actually like the way Bitcoin works, you're only receiving the valid proof of work. And, and as long as you have one peer that's willing to give you the valid proof of work, you're going to figure out the most proof of work chain. Uh, and, and it's the same here, basically. Okay, so let's try to dissect that. Like, there are there are two competing chains. One is the heavier proof of work chain. So let's say it has five blocks at a certain difficulty target. Um, and if we would go by SPV, this longer chain would be the preferable one over a shorter or weaker chain. Yeah. Um, um, but if we consider these uh, proof of work fraud proofs. Um, we basically can say that if there was a fork, uh, we check the, the common ancestor block of both of these chains. Right? So if in, in your example, one, two, three, four, five and one, two, three B, the common ancestor block here is, uh, block number two. So yeah. both chains assume or claim that block number two is valid. Uh, therefore, we don't, or the verifier does not even need to look at block number two because both miners think it's valid. Uh, but they disagree with block number three, right? The heaviest proof of work chain says block three A is valid, while the weaker proof of work chain says block three B is valid. Yeah. And now the, the verifier checks both of these and sees which one of them is valid. Uh, I assume if both of them are valid, then you just continue with the most heavy proof of work chain. Right? This would be, for example, the case if there was an orphan block just because of latency in the mining process. Yeah. Right? And then both blocks are valid, but just one happens to have more proof of work. Uh, while if one of these are invalid, and also, for example, if block 3B in the smaller proof of work chain is invalid, well, it doesn't matter. It's in the smaller chain anyway. Right? Yeah. So this is, you can continue to disregard it. But if in that heavy proof of work chain, block number 3A is in fact invalid, well, then it doesn't matter how much proof of work this chain has. It includes an invalid transaction and therefore is not a valid blockchain. That's right. And so there are two things to add here. Uh, you don't actually have to check block 3A and 3B. It suffices to check block 3A because if 3A is valid, you just continue with, uh, with the most proof of work mm -hmm. chain. Um, so, so it's really just one, one block that you're checking. Uh, so that's nice, right? It's less work. Um, and, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, so, so one thing I, I didn't explain yet, which is important, um, is that what we're doing here is we're, we're validating a state transition. We're uh, validating the transition from block two to block three, uh, either block three A or three B. Um, and this transition itself is actually not something that a um, light client uh, or, or SPV uh, node normally can va validate uh, because validating the transition uh, require you are validating an entire block here. Um, in order to validate any block in, inside of the chain, you need to know the state of the UTXO set, uh, the block prior to it. Um, so there needs to be one additional uh, uh, thing step here. And that is we need a low bandwidth way to validate every transition. So the transition from block two to block three, from block three to block four, et cetera, all needs to be, you need to be able to validate that separately from consensus in its entirety. Uh, and this is something that uh, U3XO uh, by Taj Dreja uh, actually uh, literally solves. Uh, so it allows for you, like, like I don't think we have to get into it uh, in the specifics, but at a high level, uh, basically what you can do is you can take, uh, what is, comes down to the equivalent of a UTXO set commitment. Uh, you can put a hash of the UTXO set commitment inside of each Bitcoin block. And then you can use that to prove, uh, that the transactions that are being spent in block three, either in block three A or block three B, um, that they were actually validly part of the UTXO set, uh, at block two. Uh, so this allows you to, basically validate a, a transition. Uh, it needs a little bit of extra data. So on top of downloading a block, you also need to download roughly one megabyte worth of uh, so-called U3XO proofs. Um, but this would allow you to validate a transition without requiring the UTXO sets. 
Yes, I see. That's a very important part. And otherwise, you would need to have some sort of index of the UTXO set for each block. Yeah, there, there's no way of doing it. Uh, yeah, you just need something like like this, like like UTXO, in order to do it. Uh huh. I see. Okay, so then can you summarize, or, or are we missing something to explain how the technology works? Uh, we're we're almost there. So, um, yeah. So at the high level, you have a main chain. And the main chain also validates a bunch of soft chains, but they're doing so in a very cheap way, right? This is, uh, you know, uh, it's called proof of work fraud proofs in my, uh, uh write ups. Uh, but you can think of it as just sort of like an, you know, an SPV validation, but it's better than SPV. It's actually very close to, uh, a full node validation. Um, oh yeah, I guess it's important to point out. Uh, I, I called it slow validation. And the reason for that is that. You sort of have to assume that there are not many honest miners. So you have to like, let's say, uh, you know, maybe 1% of all miners is honest. Um, then you actually have to wait for this 1% miner to create a block, uh, in order to figure out that a, a very long chain is actually an invalid chain. And this slows down your consensus. So where, let's say normally, if, if you run one of these nodes, you, you could also run it for Bitcoin. Like this is actually this technology that this, this could just work for Bitcoin if we had. Uh, UTXO set commitments like UTXO, uh, soft fork in. Uh, with that assumption, you could do this. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I lost my train of thought here. It's, um, it's about the slow peg out, right? So that you need to wait right, 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 yeah, yeah, before yeah. a transaction can be considered confirmed. Right, right, yeah. So the, uh, yeah, the, the transaction, you need to wait for, uh, uh, one of these honest miners to create a block. So this might actually take a hundred blocks for, before this honest miner creates its block. So you, you, you can't just assume uh, that a transaction is valid until you've waited long enough for whatever your assumption threshold is for uh, this 1% miner in this case to have created their block. So what would normally be one confirmation or six confirmations, let's say, and now you have to wait 600 confirmations. Uh, and only then can you kind of be satisfied that a transaction is valid if it's, if it's inside of the most proof of work chain that is, uh, for, from which you also checked all the fork blocks. But doesn't that leave you open for somewhat of an attack vector that a, a quote-unquote honest but malicious miner can fork off the chain in the past? So uh, just creating one block in a fork at many points, and now a, a verifying client in this method needs to check all of these many blocks uh, where that, that have a single fork, uh, so that would again increase the verification cost. Yeah. Um, so what you, what you have in this system is you need to have some kind of, um, point at which, uh, you get, um, finality, essentially. You can put that point very, um, conservative in, uh, let's see, you can take like one year from now. So what that means is that you assume that if, um, if, if there was something invalid about it, it would have happened within a year. And then if you have one year worth of proof of work and then somebody forks a block from prior to that one year, you just ignore it at that point. Yeah, that's um, useful because, I mean, yeah. think back to the early days, right? The difficulty to find a valid Bitcoin block was much lower. Right? And nowadays with an ASIC machine, you can find a valid proof of work basically within seconds right? for these early high difficulty periods. That's um, right. Uh, so, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and it turns out that that's also sort of inevitable in this entire system, because so continuing on to kind of how the uh, how the sidechain as a whole kind of how it functions as as a sidechain to Bitcoin. So you have the Bitcoin main chain. You have let's say ten of these soft chains. Everybody validates these soft chains, but they do so in the method that I described, which is very cheap on bandwidth and but it's very slow validation. Uh, pegging into a chain is very simple. Uh, you literally just point to one of these uh, soft chains and you just freeze the coins essentially uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain and you just say, okay, now these coins cannot be moved anymore on the Bitcoin blockchain until we hear back from the soft chain. Uh, and when the soft chain says, uh, hey, these coins are pegged out, uh, then they can move again. So the peg out part, that's the more complicated part. How that works is you first create a peg out on a soft chain. And then once you have uh, this transaction in inside of a block on the soft chain, 
you also create a pending peg out on the main chain. So you say, I am going to peg out from this soft chain, and you point to a specific soft chain block. And from that moment on, you're going to wait one year. Uh, one year is an arbitrary number, but, uh, you know, you want to, you want to have it be a, a big number because uh, that's safer. And then if after one year, the block that you pointed to is still valid according to our soft chain consensus mechanism, right? So the mechanism that checks all the proof of work and checks all the forks. If it's still in there after a year, so no block appeared that made the uh, the chain in which that pegout was invalid. Uh, then the pegout becomes valid one year one year from then. And that's also why you need the uh, cutoff period of one year that I mentioned earlier, because once the pegout is valid, uh, you know you can't reorder back past one year. Uh, once you have a pegout, uh, you know the the uh, rewinding after after a pegout occurs would be inflation. Uh, so that's necessary either way. Uh, and then the hope is that one year is conservative enough uh, for that to not be an issue because you do need the ability uh, for chains to to reorg to a certain extent. But you know, a one-year reorg would be kind of insane. Yes, I see. Um, but then the... So on the peg out, I only... Or the verifier of the parent blockchain only needs to verify the peg out transactions of the sidechain. A certain soft chain. Um, they need to see the pegout transaction, and they need to know that the chain in which the pegout transaction uh, is is committed is a valid chain. And the way that they know the chain is valid is through the consensus mechanism that we just uh, uh, talked about with the forks. Uh-huh, I see. So I do not need to verify the full chain with every single transaction that happened on the soft chain. No. Uh no, you don't you don't at all. Um like like literally it, it it's very similar to the SPV assumption, right? Where you have a transaction inside of a chain and you assume that that transaction is valid, but now your assumption that the transaction is valid is much stronger because you're not just saying, "Okay, this is the most proof of work chain." No, you're saying this is a chain for which if a fork, whenever a fork occurred, I checked the block. So I know that during a one-year period, there was not a single miner that tried to create a fork because he thought a block was invalid. So uh, this miner could even be a user of the soft chain, right? So there's literally nobody on the entire, in, uh, no user of the entire soft chain, uh, none of the miners that thought like in this one-year period, uh, the peg out wasn't valid, therefore this other block therefore this other block was created. Um and quite literally, everybody on the soft chain is incentivized to create such a block if if a, if an event like that occurred. Let's say there's an invalid peg out, right? There's an invalid transaction, and nobody's creating a fork uh, at that point. If nobody's creating a fork and one year goes by, then everybody on the soft chain loses their money. So, you know, after half a year and nobody creating a, creating a fork, these uh, soft chain users, they have to go, you know, they have to get together and say like, Hey, um, we got to create a block now because otherwise we all lose our funds. Uh, but you know, it's even simpler than that because, uh, the re reality is, is the fork is the valid chain, right? Like if there's an invalid chain and all these soft chain users they, for a half a year, just no block appeared. Because the only possible valid block would be a block that, that forks away from the invalid block. Um, so it, it's literally the chain would have to stand still for a year. No valid block would have to be created in order for uh, 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 invalid pegouts to succeed. I see that's interesting. And so I, I guess if the block creation becomes impossible or very costly for the sidechain, then that would be a case. There, there's a theoretical case where it's possible. Um, it's just extremely unlikely. Um, and yeah, it, it is a scenario where it succeeds. I think that the only scenario I can think of is a scenario where that soft chain is just completely under, like not being valued. Uh, people are barely using it and it's being completely neglected. Maybe then they can steal the remaining coins. You know, maybe everybody abandoned it and there are a couple of users that lost their keys and now 
somebody wants to steal those remaining coins or something. And maybe then they can succeed, but very practically speaking, it's almost impossible. Uh huh, I see. W- one of the other questions I have is about coin selection for the on chain transactions. Uh, so specifically for the pack out, I as a user, which on chain coin on the parent layer do I actually choose to spend? Yeah, so that would have to just be some kind of deterministic uh, uh, code that just decides. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But there's going to be, uh, inside of Bitcoin consensus, there needs to be management of the soft chain coins. Um, you could do it so that there is only a single uh, UTXO. So every time there's a peg-in, you also have to kind of merge the existing UTXO with... Um, with the new coins that you're sending to the to the chain, so that way you know the the coin management will be easier. Um, or you could just keep track of all the UTXOs that are inside of every uh, um, every soft chain. So th- there are multiple ways of doing it. Um, I'm not like you know. I think this is a decision that needs to be made once it's actually being built, right? So uh, at the very least, it should be clear that there are multiple solutions and they're all equally viable. So. Uh, you can just do whatever uh, seems, uh, you know, most practical. Yeah, but I think this is probably a, quite a difficult problem, right? Because coin selection is already difficult for an individual. Now, how are you going to do it in this somewhat decentralized autonomous organization of this option? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's a, I mean, it's a difficult problem for privacy reasons and and things like that, right? So, and that's not something that's uh, like here. It's very clear when something. You're you're not hiding the fact that you're moving to a soft chain. In fact, in fact, the whole the whole point is that that's verifiable. Um, so I think from that perspective, uh, it becomes a lot easier, right? You you just need to get the coins. Uh, it doesn't really matter where they come from. Um, and I guess there are ways that to do it that are you know more and less uh, efficient. Um, but yeah, like I said, like the easiest way of doing it, right? And, and that's maybe the, just the clearest way of thinking of it. It's just that whatever you peg in, you merge with one single UTXO that is that has all the coins of that soft chain. And when you peg out, you spend from that one single UTXO. And then you only allow one peg, peg in or one peg out per block, for instance. Yes, but here maybe the issue would be that it's rather expensive to always destroy a coin and create a new one, right? Uh, and that it might be more on-chain fee efficient to create multiple coins when the fees are high rather than spending them too. And then when fees are low, consolidating Mm -hmm. all these coins. Yeah, so I think generally what will end up happening is that, um, especially if you do it in such a way that only one one of these transactions can happen per per block, um, it actually ends up being the Bitcoin miners that are going to be the one who do the peg-ins and the peg-outs. well, at least, at least if there's a peg in it and there, there's any profit there, uh, because there is higher demand on, on the soft chain. Uh, if there's any profit whatsoever, uh, the miner is incentivized to just take, take that profit. Um, yeah. So I guess the way I look at it, generally speaking, I, I, I would agree with you that there might be ways in which you can, uh, make more optimal use of, of block space. Uh, and there might be better ways of doing it and there may be worse ways of doing it. Uh, but like, like from my perspective, as, as of this stage, uh, the, the main important thing is, is it possible, <laughs> right? And if it's possible, great. Then uh, are there uh, complicated, better ways or simpler, uh, ways that are less efficient? Uh, you know, that's kind of a secondary question that I just basically, yeah, I, I have no answer for right now. Yeah. And that's probably some implementation details that can be figured out and improved. Uh, yeah. Many steps afterwards. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Getting from zero to one is the main ambition right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so for each of these kind of second layer solutions, what requirements do we need to change on the parent lane, parent layer consensus to make it work? Yeah. So, uh, to stick with soft chains for a second, um, this one is quite invasive in terms of, uh, what you gotta do. So. <clears throat> Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe it's good to kind of like, you know, talk a little bit more high level here. And, uh, um, so the soft chain system, it, every chain that you create is essentially a soft fork. And that's why it's called soft chains. 
Um, so you need a, you need a general soft fork that kind of act like allows for the system to exist in the first place, which is, for instance, the UTXO set management and the peg ins and the peg outs. And then every time you want to create a chain, because everybody has to validate this new chain, uh, it needs to become part of consensus. And this is also kind of risky in terms of, uh, you know, you could have consensus bugs in these new chains. So if you do something fancy like an Ethereum chain, it's actually a bad idea. Uh, because these could contain consensus bugs and that could actually indirectly affect Bitcoin. Uh, so you want the, the consensus rules to also be Bitcoin like, uh, it, because that basically minimizes the amount of new code that you, that you need. Uh, so you could maybe create chains with uh, confidential transactions, for instance, right? That would be a relatively minor chain. So, so the soft chain would be exactly like Bitcoin, but it's a confidential transaction chain. So it has just this one, uh, one change inside of it, basically. Um, but yeah, so that is, I would say, significant. And I, I think like the nice thing about the solution is that it's literally you know, the first time we've had something that is an actual decentralized sidechain, right? Like actually, uh, that works and has no, like doesn't have the nasty kind of lowered security assumptions. Uh, you could argue that drive chain is also like something like that, but a lot of people are uncomfortable, uh, you know, with the drive chain assumption because it sort of, uh, assumes that miners aren't going to steal from the side chain, though theoretically they could. Um, so it's invasive, um, but it's possible. Uh, I think really this is something that won't be on anyone's radar until, uh, Block space is really, we're in dire need of increasing the on-chain block space and all the layer two solutions, uh, that are not this have been kind of worked out and there, there are lots of federated side chains and still we're looking at, uh, yeah, the main chain and just are saying like, damn, we need more space. I think that's, you know, that's the moment where something like this becomes, uh, discussable. Uh, so I, that's kind of far future. Uh, space chains on the other hand are very much viable. Uh, and in fact, you could start doing it today. Um, it's essentially, uh, it requires a, uh, so-called covenant transaction. So what, what, in order to create the, the consensus, uh, for the space chain, you create basically a sequence of transactions for which one can appear in every Bitcoin block and the easy way of doing it that doesn't require any software whatsoever uh, would be with basically a series of pre-signed transactions. So if you sign these transactions ahead of time uh, and afterwards you forget the key, <laughs> that's an important aspect here. So there is kind of a, uh, a trusted setup in, in that regard. If you, if you forget the key, uh, then you can use this, this, this uh, sequence of transactions to attach uh, anyone else can attach their input and output to it essentially and add a, add a hash to create a space chain block. Um, so you could create that today, but there are two downsides. So the first is, is the trusted setup. Trusted setup is not terrible because, uh, it, it's not, it's not pr good either, but it's not terrible because there is no, um, the only harm that the person that, uh, is supposed to forget the key, but might not have forgotten the key. The only harm that they can do is, they can fork the chain, and when they fork the chain, the chain, the consensus halts. So they can basically stop consensus, and then consensus has to restart uh, via hard fork. Uh, not ideal, but the harm is relatively minor. Uh, you know, it's a nuisance uh, attack. It's it's not a, a loss of funds attack. Now the second problem is a little bit more pernicious, and that's um, that. In order to do this today, it actually requires two transactions per block. I'm not going to get into the, the entire details, but what it comes down to is you need to create an output. And this output needs to be spent by the second transaction. But creating an output has a minimum of, uh, I, I'm not sure how many Satoshi, was, something like 400 Satoshi, uh, roughly, needs to be in the output. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, Bitcoin Core wanted to prevent spam outputs, right? If you create an output that is not economically viable to spend, uh, because it, you, it can be not economically viable to spend because it costs more to spend it than it costs it, uh, than, than it's inside of the output. 
Uh, so for this reason, you cannot create a, let's say, one Satoshi output. So anyone who wants to create this series of transactions has to put 400 Satoshis, an output of 400 Satoshis in every transaction, in every block, and they have to pay for that ahead of time, and they have to pay for that for as long as they want the space chain to exist. So if that's for like multiple years, uh, this actually, you know, comes down to, uh, and they have to pay for the fee for that specific transaction as well. Um, this comes down to like a hundred thousand dollars or something. Uh, so, so that means it's very expensive if you were to do it today. But the good news is that, um, the, the only reason this, uh, for this one Satoshi output is not allowed is because, right, it's uneconomical to spend. But if you were to spend it in the same block, which is what we're doing here, uh, then actually that reason goes away. Because like the, the whole reason was you create an output and nobody's ever going to spend it because it's uneconomical. But we're not actually creating the outputs. We're creating it and we're, we're spending it right away in the same block. Uh, and because of that, the, the reason for which Bitcoin Core doesn't allow outputs with just one Satoshi or literally even zero Satoshis is actually not valid in this specific use case. So there is, uh, there is a good reason. And, and I have yet to talk to, uh, other developers about this, but there's, you know, there, there might be a way, uh, in which this wouldn't be a soft fork, but it would just be a consensus. It would be a change, a uh, propagation rule change. Uh, but there might be a way to do this, to allow Bitcoin Core to do this without, um, uh, yeah, without actually having to create expensive outputs like that. Yeah, I see. And, you know, especially predicting the fee rate in, uh, for the future is well, impossible by definition. Right? Uh, and that's going to make it difficult. Um, is there actually a requirement that every base layer block has a transaction of the space chain? Um, it's not absolutely required, but, but to your prior point, um, you don't actually have to predict the fees ahead of time because, uh, the way it works is there are two transactions. There's one transaction for which you have to pay a minimum fee because again, it's a propagation rule. Uh, so, you know, that's something that could change. Um, uh, it could be changed in Bitcoin Core without a soft fork. Uh, but you know, that, that requires, uh, you know, a lot of work. Um, but it's actually that second transaction and that second tra transaction that is basically paying for the first transaction. That's the one, uh, that users create and that's the one that users attach their, uh, hash to. And that's the one that's going to actually be paying the fees for the first transaction. So, so you don't have to estimate, uh, what the fees are going to be. That's, that's actually not an issue. Um, and then to your second question, um, you don't, uh, have to have one space chain block every Bitcoin block. Let's say Bitcoin fees are high and space chain fees are very low. This might actually create a situation where it's not economical to create a space chain block. So then you just simply wait for one block. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Uh, this is done by, uh, um, it's a relative time lock. So, you can put a, a transaction into a Bitcoin block and then the next transaction you have to, you can't put it in the same block, right? You have to at least put it in the next block or a block later or even a, another block later. Mm -hmm. And then once that transaction hits the blockchain, then the next block also has to wait one block. The next transaction also has to wait one block uh, because again, it's a relative time lock relative to when the transaction got mined. Uh, so that's absolutely fine. Okay, I see. But uh, you said that so you only create a space chain block if it is actually economical in doing so. So if you create, if you earn enough space chain tokens, uh, as a mining reward, and only then does it make sense to bet or, or to, uh, bid for the parent blockchain, uh, fees. Yeah, because like otherwise you would be mining a block at a loss, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, like I, I think it's going to be relatively easy for there to be enough space chain fees to create, you know, to pay for one single Bitcoin transaction, even if the Bitcoin transaction fees are going to be high. Uh, that one Bitcoin transaction represents, you know, an entire space chain block worth of fees. And that space chain itself might also contain other space chains. Uh, and those have fees. So, you know, it all kind of adds up. Um, so, you know, in practice, I don't think it's, you know, maybe in the beginning during bootstrapping, it'll happen. 
But eventually, once the space chain gets going, uh, I don't really think it's going to be a problem. Uh huh. I see. Yet it's still somewhere in the hands of the miners to choose when to generate that next block or when to start bidding for it. Well, although anyone can become a space chain miner. Yeah, the, the funny thing is uh, you only need some bitcoins. So anyone who runs a space chain full node uh, and has some bitcoins could like, theoretically just push a button and start suggesting blocks. Is this proof of stake? Um, well, that depends on your definition of proof of stake, but I would say no. Uh, no, not at all. Um, there are interesting variants that you can do. Like, so, so the way this, this consensus mechanism of mine specifically works is by paying fees to Bitcoin miners. Um, but, you know, other people have thought of, uh, things like doing, essentially, you can do mining as long as you do something that's provably expensive. So in this case, paying fees to Bitcoin miners is provably expensive. But you could also do proof of burn consensus, where you burn Bitcoins and you get consensus that way. And people get confused sometimes because I do use burning in space chains, but it's not for consensus, right? It's only for creating tokens. Um, and then the, the third way, which you could consider proof of stake, is literally you lock up Bitcoins. And because you locked up Bitcoins... That is basically how you are uh, competing with other people to create a uh, an alternate block uh, blockchain block. Um, so, so that would be kind of that would be a way that would be something you could call proof of stake. Uh, but I think you know even that is uh, it's not proof of stake in the sense that altcoins use it basically. Yes, and one thing that's also interesting to point out here is that we have two different tokens in the proof of stake system or quote unquote proof of stake system here making it probably not proof-of-stake or at least something different. Uh, because with traditional proof-of-stake, you need to hold the token in order to create a block of that blockchain and then receive more of the same token. Yeah. While in the space chain model, the miner does not even need to hold space chain tokens. Right? Uh, yeah. He just needs to have Bitcoin and spend them uh, and by spending Bitcoin, he will get more space chain tokens as mining reward. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh, interesting. So maybe we could say proof of work is expanding or sacrificing energy uh, in order to create new blocks. Proof of stake is uh, uh, is sacrificing the time value of holding the the actual token of that blockchain, while yeah. space chains is the sacrifice of precious Bitcoin to create a block uh, on that space chain. No, you're wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yes and no, because so the, 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 the confusing part here is that you're, you're comparing there's consensus and there's token creation, right? Mm -hmm. So the consensus part uh, is, is actually proof of work. It's Bitcoin's proof of work because you're paying Bitcoin to Bitcoin miners. Mm -hmm. And the Bitcoin miners will, will compete for, for the fees, uh, and, and they turn it into proof of work. So the consensus mechanism here is not burning. It's the, the token creation. And, and those are kind of two separate things. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure how clear <laughs> the, the separation is, but hopefully you understand how, how, how those two are, are separate. Yes, uh, what, what I was meaning was not necessarily creation of new space chain tokens, but rather how to earn more space chain tokens as fees, uh, as, as mining fees. And here, if you want to get the mining fee of the space chain blockchain, then you will need to spend Bitcoin on the parent blockchain. Yeah, you need to spend them, but you, you, you shouldn't, uh, you don't need to burn them to, to yeah. earn them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very, very fascinating, Ruben. This is, uh, this is some serious next, uh, <laughs> higher level, uh, blockchain wizardry. <laughs> yeah, we discussed a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we did get quite an interesting topic, Chris, over the kind of more philosophical things of, of what are actually sidechains and how to kind of conceptualize them. And then getting into some of the newer proposals for sidechains. And we, we didn't even talk about half of the awesome work that you do. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a lot to discuss uh yeah and uh no i, I kind of liked it because like you know i think if, if we try to get through everything it's just going to be um very uh you know 
um, short and, and not really uh, in depth. So I like that we kind of went a little deeper. And I also like that we, we talked about, you know, just federated sidechains in general. Um, you know, that's also very interesting stuff that, um, yeah, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of, kind of glad that you asked me about, you know, things that are related to my work, but not, not directly my work, right? I, I haven't really, well, I guess state chains is a form of federated sidechains, but the, the, the regular federated sidechain model is not something I particularly worked on, but I do have a lot of opinions on. So that's, I think, something very also novel for people who I know like to listen to me talk. I, I, I know I have a bunch of fans who follow me to every podcast. So uh, <laughs> they will hear something different instead of me re explaining soft chains and space chains for the fifth time. Uh, so I think that was that was actually quite interesting. Yeah, though I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, for these complex models, you know, g- getting to hear a couple different explanations in different contexts is always very interesting. And that's meaningful. true. Yeah. Uh, but yes, hopefully, also with focusing a bit on the privacy of these protocols for different participants, uh, we, we could shed some new light on this as well. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm happy that you came here and that we had this conversation. Uh, but, but yes, you're, uh, so incredibly fast with putting out high quality new work. <laughs> and then for sure, you, you have to come back on the show, uh, to talk yeah. about, uh, more things, you know, especially atomic swaps, uh, which is another of your fortes, which are very That's interesting right. for Bitcoin privacy. Yeah. No, there's, uh, there's plenty more we could have talked about. And I gotta say, I'm impressed also that you did your homework, uh, because I know how hard it is. Like, you know, I have, I mean, that's also part of my challenge. I feel it's like these are very interesting things, but. It, it's it's difficult for outsiders to also know what they should learn about and and to actually take the time to to try and understand all that stuff and you know just you know i i can i can tell from you know how you uh, summarize the things that i say uh that you've actually you know you went and you looked at all these things and you, you studied them as well so i appreciate that and that also made for a higher quality conversation yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it's kind of funny that my kind of background in monetary history and you know economical thinking kind of made it obvious that when I read the the um, you know liquid white paper or however you might want to call it, <laughs> uh, I, I realized like rather quickly that oh yeah, this is a money warehouse. That's actually interesting. Uh, so right. uh, yeah, there. I think there are some some concepts or, or analogies that really make sense in the federated sidechain. But now, a couple of years afterwards, especially with your contributions to making sidechains more, uh, well, different, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that analogy really starts to break down and we see where, you know, this technology might even lead us in the future. Uh, it's for sure yeah. incredibly fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ruben, um, uh, thank you very much again for coming. Uh, maybe uh, now is a good time to let the people know where they can learn more about uh, side chains, uh, space chains, spanking chains, all the chains that you work on. <laughs> spanking chains is, uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta work on that a little more, but you know, it'll, it'll be coming. Um, yeah, so you can find me on Twitter uh, at Samson Rubin, uh, R U B E N. There's no E in there. Uh, well, there's an E in the second part, I guess, but anyway, R U B E N. And, uh, yeah, there's a, I guess a good link to go to is tiny.cc slash Samson. Uh, that's, uh, a link where I kind of put all the links to my work. So if you want to check that out, you can check, uh, you, you can go there. Also, if you like hearing me ramble, uh, I have a podcast of my own, uh, called the Unhashed Podcast that I do together with three other co-hosts. Um, so check that out as well. If you are into podcasting and, uh, like hearing my beautiful voice. Oh yeah, no, the Unhash podcast is really one of the one of the great shows that I'd like to follow. Uh, it ca- kind of sad uh, that oh my god, uh, they're serious. Uh, kind of dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Oh my god, they're serious. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, it got a little stale. Like we used to have for for uh, maybe people who are recent listeners, they don't even know, but we used to have a segment where we just make fun of uh, ridiculous ICOs, uh, such as <laughs> Pembiant was one, which is like a was that the, I think that was the rhino, uh, syn- synthetic rhino horn, uh, ICO. So just re- ridiculous stuff like that. So we, we pick an ICO every time and just make fun of how, how ridiculous it was. But, you know, like after a while, it's like, it's the same joke, right? Because these ICOs are just so incredibly ridiculous. So even though it was funny, uh, we had to uh, kill the segments, uh, eventually. Yeah, but maybe soon you can revive it uh, with the silly space chain ideas that people come up with. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> we'll see. Yes. 
Well, Pierce, for sure. Oh, oh, yeah. But w- one thing uh, uh, I, that I gotta nag you on: y- you really yeah. gotta get your podcast onto Podcasting 2.0 uh, because uh, it's kind of ridiculous that I'm listening to your beautiful voice and I cannot toss you satoshis. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know. I briefly, like, I, I barely know what it is, uh, but I did see a link. Um, so yeah, explain to me what is exactly, uh, what is this thing? So the idea is more in the technical side to have an extension to the RSS field, which is in general called a namespace. Uh, and here is currently the creation of a new decentralized kind of standard for a namespace, not done by a company like Apple or Spotify, right? um, but by an open contribution process. And one of these fields in this namespace RSS edition is the value tag. And this value tag is very simply just your Lightning Network node public key. And the idea is that this node is online and has key sense receiving enabled, uh, meaning that people can create an invoice for your full node without actually talking to you. And now when your podcatcher sees the RSS uh, uh, file with that namespace and that Lightning node in the value field, it can now actually initiate Bitcoin payments over the Lightning Network to your node uh, at whenever uh, you know time, uh, including for example when for every minute that the listener watches uh, or listens to your beautiful podcast, uh, the podcatcher can send ten satoshis, a hundred satoshis per minute, and or if there is something interesting being said, the user can boost and give another thousand sets extra on top of that, for example. Ah, I see. So. So how does this like um how, from the user perspective what do they do they have to have like a special podcast listening app that also supports lightning or like how do they interact with this Yes exactly right now the podcatcher itself needs to understand lightning and uh, for example the breeze wallet which is a mobile lightning network client uh does that very nicely they have a podcatcher uh, integrated into their wallet uh, uh-huh. the, the Sphinx chat, uh, which is also this, oh, I would say somewhat hacky application of the Lightning Network as a messaging protocol, um, but that has a podcatcher involved too. Um, there so, are. So, so do you then have to listen inside of like Breeze Wallet? Like you have to listen to the podcast through Breeze Wallet, or like what's the? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and that's uh, uh, to be honest, a bit kind of weird because imagine you know having ten different podcatchers. Uh, and then each of these podcatchers has its own Lightning Network wallet with its own records. <laughs> it kind of gets yeah. messy. So it would be I cool see. if we can figure out kind of a way that a podcatcher without a Lightning wallet can figure out how to talk to a Bitcoin wallet on the same mm-hmm. hardware somehow in the background. Yeah, um, but I, I see the potential. I, I understand that it would be nice if we could have podcasts that have a very easy clickable whatever link where you sent Satoshi's either while listening or as a tip. Um, and it's just right there, um, within the RSS feed, uh, of it, the available data is right there. Yeah. That does sound nice. Yeah. And one of the cool things is you can actually provide multiple lightning node public keys in that RSS field. So for you, it could be the four guys of you each having his own individual node pub key, uh, in there getting, you know, for example, everyone gets 23%. And then, you know, 2% goes to the Breeze wallet, uh, and 2% goes to podcastindex.org, for example. Right. So we can okay. have five, six, 10 different recipients of these payments. Maybe even your guest on the show. Right. So here on the Wasabikas podcast, I could put a, your lightning note pub key, or, you know, maybe even one of a donation facility, like, mm. uh, the, the, the state chain funds, for example. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah, that, that does sound nice. So then, uh, basically the user is directed to send the payments partially to one person, partially to another person or whatever kind of, uh, setup you have going there. Yeah, that, that sounds useful. Yes. And right now it's not atomic, um, but just independent lighting payments to independent, uh, public keys. Mm, yeah, that seems okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, like, this is a really fascinating model. And I personally, as a user, both while sending and receiving, <laughs> uh, enjoy the feature quite a lot. But I'm somewhat mm-hmm. afraid that we're breaking the lightning network here. Because <laughs> probably in the last couple of weeks where I've been listening to podcasts this way, I have made more Bitcoin transactions than in the last couple of years combined. 
<laughs> so do, do you like yeah. set that one satoshi per second or what are you doing <laughs> As, no it depends on the podcast like it's it's between uh, uh let's say 10 25 maybe even 100 sats per minute um and then but i'm more personally i like to lowball the sat per minute so let's say going to something like 10 sats per minute and then hitting the boost button with 500 or a thousand sats more frequently and okay. But you know, ultimately, that that gets you roughly one thousand sats per episode, um, and mm. you know that's actually a, still rather small. Uh, but for you know, if you're on the receiving side of that, and you get, have a couple listeners tossing in like this, it does yeah. make a difference for sure. Yeah, and I, I'm also kind of wondering, like, would it be nice? I, I don't know exactly what this boost button is, but it would be nice if you could, like, sort of at a certain timestamp, right? Like, if like one hour in. Uh, you know, something funny is being said or, or something you, you think is really valuable. You could sort of like send a payment at that moment, right? And then we would know that, oh, people appreciated this and this is where all the uh, tips are coming in. And that would be kind of cool. Yeah. This is like for the first time kind of real financial feedback on your content, right? Which has never happened before. I'm sure you could somehow get interest based on you no know, likes or view time of drop off rate. But that works great in a centralized system, nearly impossible in a decentralized system like RSS. And so having the financial feedback integrated into the, into that podcasting experience is, I think, interesting. But, but one of the downsides, right? You just have the same lightning node public key in all your RSS feeds for all the episodes. So in mm. fact, you don't even know who, who pays you and yeah. for what reason and for what episode, unless the sender opts into this. I believe that Breeze Wallet has it implemented in a way that there is some episode title and I think even the timestamp somehow mm. integrated in the payment field. That would be nice. Yeah, that, that sounds kind of interesting to see that data. Yeah, but then again, how do you actually display that data to the podcaster? I'm not sure if any wallet does that. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I, you know, I think more about these things in terms of like future potential, right? Like, sure, mm. it's not working perfectly today, but that's not, you know, it's it's more about like where this can go, right? And and I can see it being potentially useful there. So so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So for the listeners out there, get yourself the Breeze wallet or the Sphinx wallet. Head to the podcast uh, chapter and check out the Join the Was a Because uh, podcast. That is podcasting 2.0 enabled. And then uh, for you, Ruben, uh, go to podcasterwallet.com. This is where you can sign up with the email account of a podcast RSS feed. Uh, and then set a lightning node public key and it will mm. magically work. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Ruben. So nice that we actually talked about uh, podcasting and the future of that as well. <laughs> uh, any other final thoughts, final points uh, that you cannot let the viewers get out without? Um, I guess uh, I can give like one maybe shout out to a specific episode that was good to listen to. Um, so on the on S podcast, I believe it's episode 129, which is, uh, an episode with Eric Wall, uh, where we talk about, uh, layer two scaling, a bit more of a techie episode. And we kind of also discuss, um, approach to scaling that Ethereum is following and to what degree that may or may not uh, apply to Bitcoin in the future. So it's, it's, it was a very popular episode. It's, it's a good one. So if you like the more techy stuff, because we, we really don't hold back. It's literally just a conversation between me and Eric. Um, so go listen to that one. Yeah. It was one, 129. Yeah. I can attest that was a very good one. Okay. Piers, you got your homework too. Ruben put out a, a bunch of content about how all this sorcery works. So go out, accumulate. 